Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. That'll do a podcast. That'll, That'll do, do podcast. That'll do a podcast. Guys, this movie's weird. Yeah. <laughs> Big Pig in the City? It's a yeah, little weird. Griffin? It's a little Are you odd. sure you watched a different movie? I I watched this whole movie, I know, because I was mouth agape for the solid hour and 35 minutes. My tongue dried off and blew away in the wind like sand. That's weird because I just Googled Babe Pig in the City and the top result is having a normal one. I don't think this is a weird <laughs> movie. I think this huh. is a pretty straight down the middle. This is like a standard meat and potatoes movie. Oh, oh yeah, no. I saw that the MPAA uh, rated this movie as regular. Yeah. Yes. Hey, normal, normal film for normal people. <laughs> right. I, this, this movie is, makes sense to me. Can I ask? I, I want to ask right off the bat. Because we just have to like get our, through the controversy of this movie. We're not going to do like the, an intro or anything or like who I am. We're going to do all of that. But first, I just want to address the big controversy because obviously there's like <laughs> there's a big debate within the film community about Babe Pig in the City. Uh huh. What's that? Is this the best film featuring Mickey Rooney playing a character named Fugly Flume? Is this the number one? Uh, whoa, man, that's so tough. Because right? I loved his work in Deep Blue Sea. Yeah, I was about to say, like, he he, he didn't do that in Bugsy. I, I could have sworn. No, you're, th you're thinking Bugsy. of Fugsley. <laughs> yeah, Fugsley <laughs> Flume. Um, you know, I, you know what? I'm going to say it's top five, at least. It's definitely top five. It's an yeah. easy top five. A and hey, it's tough to make the five. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Griffin Newman. My name is David Sims. And this is Blank Check with Griffin and David. It's a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion products they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they go to the city, baby. Yeah. <laughs> and this uh, is a mini series on the films of George Miller. It is called Mad Pod Fury Cast. And today we're talking about his most bug nuts movie, which is... I mean, that's saying something. It's saying he has never made a not bug nuts movie. No. Correct? Correct. Right? Right? What's his most normal film? Lorenzo's Oil. The Witches of Eastwick? I don't like. The bug nuts. I don't know. But yeah. th this is in every way uh, his most bug nuts movie. Uh, it's called Bay Pig in the City. Uh, it is the number one top rated film on IMDb about uh, pigs in cities. Yes. Okay. And joining us today, from my brother, my brother, and me, from the Adventure Zone, ladies and gentlemen, Travis McElroy. Hi, it's me, Travis McElroy. I disliked this film. Oh, boy. While also enjoying watching it. Thank you. Now, you <laughs> they, I don't know if that's possible. I had a, a strange dichotomy going on in my brain. You made mm. you made a mistake right off the bat. You texted me right uh -huh. after you finished watching this movie. Yes. I believe your text was fuck you, Mr. Newman. I believe that wow. was true. Yes, I believe that was true. Well, here's what. Ha hey, fellas, let's get real for a minute. I tried to watch this film with my three and a half year old. And that was the mistake. I, that was the mistake. Yeah. Huge like, mistake. You need to be at least 21 to see this film. I think <laughs> I know I've seen the first one. Mm -hmm. I think sure. perhaps I've never seen this film. Mm. And I was like, oh, babe, a fun family romp. Let us enjoy it. And then the first mm, five minutes, uh, Cromwell almost dies. Yep. And I was like, yep. uh, you, you know what, babe? Let's uh, let's put you on pause there. My daughter and I are going to watch some. Cromwell almost dies. Little... And Miller's Ooh. like, let's zoom in on the wound. Though. Oh my like, geez. let's get closer. Teresa and I, my wife and I were both just staring at the TV. And Teresa goes, did he die? And I was like, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, which, which I did not realize would be a refrain echoed numerous times throughout this movie <laughs> sure did he die is right. a question you never stop asking in this film it, right. yes was that a death there's was that a death right there's another question you keep asking during this film which is uh am i dead 
Like yeah, every like, moment you're watching it. Is this is the God last dead? moment? Is this the last moment of breath as the neurons flood my brain with these weird images that don't seem to match up into any kind of thing? But now I'm I'm seeing a weird fever dream of I don't know perhaps a pig in the city. Yes, and, and but is this just yeah. my dying energy that my brain is trying to make into some sense of normalcy? You feel like Flea Lick mm-hmm. out in the field chasing butterflies yes. before he's called back to Earth. Um, Which frankly. The fact that that wasn't a death made me mad. That actively angered because his life seemed so much better on the other side. It looked incredible. It looked fucking unbelievable. His life looked so tight or should I say his afterlife compared to his shitty life. Um, (laughs) Yeah, you use the word fever dream, Travis. It is a word that has come up frequently over the course of doing these George Miller movies uh, because every single one of his movies feels like a fever dream. Uh, Yeah, but... Here's here's a question that we might struggle to answer throughout the course of this whole episode. Sure. Who is this movie for? Great question. That was the question that financiers asked uh, when it was released, certainly. Because ostensibly this is a children's movie? Well, right. That was kind of the miscalculation. Yes, it was rated G. Let's see. It was Uh, originally rated PG. Oh, no, it was rated PG. It was rated it PG, PG originally. No, 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 no. They rated it PG. Then right. they thought that would be disastrous for their box office. So the ads and the posters started going out with PG. Then they re-edited it. They took out several seconds of, quote, dog violence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That is a great metal band name. <laughs> yeah, dude. And then it was re-rated G. They but I think it should have stayed PG. Yeah, they dropped off like 10 grand to every MPAA member's house that day, right? I mean, they're like, come on, make it a G. There's an argument that this film should be the first NC-10. (laughs) Yeah. There is a moment, not to jump around, but the moment with the the dog hanging Uh by a chain in the water as the other animals like look, but then turn away saying, look away, honey, look away. And it's just like, this is, and I don't know if I can curse on yeah. your show, but that that mo- even if the dog survives or whatever, the imagery of all of that is so messed up. And I just want to restate that is the dog violence that made the cut. <laughs> right. Yes, they were like G for this. Yes, general audiences. So I mean, this is the basic overview of the creation of this movie. Just to hit hit the big points. Uh, George Miller reads Babe as a book in the 80s. He goes, this is lovely. I would love to make a movie of of this someday. Yes, I believe the movie is, uh, the book is called The Sheep Pig. Yes, and then it was retitled later with Babe. Well, cash cash grab. Yes. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, But yes, he reads a cute British children's book in the 80s about a pig that's a sheepdog, and he's like, he files it away. Right. And uh, the main reason he follows it away is for the technology to catch up, to feel like both with CGI and animatronics, this film is doable. Uh, when he finally... Well, is- he jumped the gun on that. <laughs> well, <laughs> so then in the early 90s, when he realizes the film is, is producible for the first time, uh, he's sort of smarting from the failure of Lorenzo's Oil, which was a flop. And which is of Eastwick, which was him working within a studio system and feeling really chewed up by it. And I think he was sort of the 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 mythology is that he was sort of cautious about I've had two films, one that was a difficult experience to make the other one that was poorly received by and large. Right. Uh, This feels really risky for me to now suddenly make a talking pig movie when I'm the Mad Max guy. I don't know if I want this on my reputation. I don't know if I can survive another flop. So he takes Chris Noonan, who is one of his uh, protégés within the Australian yes, his, film world, and sort of... Had worked with him on Vietnam and things like that. Right. And goes, you should make this movie. This is your first feature. Uh, and the film gets made. Uh, and by all accounts, from the moment they start watching the dailies... Uh, George Miller starts seeing that the movie is working and regrets that he let someone else direct it. And so the entire production of Babe is the director 
fighting with the producer over who is the ultimate creative say in the movie. And I believe they never got over it. I believe they hate each other to this day. They hate each other to this day and constantly still talk shit about each other. Um, and like, I, I can't Chris, imagine why that sounds like such a pleasant working environment. <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? But then, against all odds, uh, this movie comes out in like August and becomes a hit, and then, uh, defying all expectations, becomes a fucking like eight time Oscar nominee, including Best Picture and Best Director. Oh, yes, I didn't, I didn't remember that. Holy they shit! They made two hundred and fifty million dollars worldwide. It was nominated for several Oscars, and including directing and writing and all that. It won the National Society of Film Critics Award for Best Film. Like, it was the critical favorite of that year, if that makes like, sense. Much like Mad Max Fury Road. It was like this weird sort of like very on its face populist commercial studio film that somehow became the critical consensus choice for like the film right. literati. Right. Uh, the, the critics that year were like, man, the movies we really dig are like Leaving Las Vegas, Safe, Bay. Right. But like that, that was where they Jeez. were rallying. Yeah. Did George Miller like get credit for for that? Was it like it's because of you that this was a huge success? Well, well I, I mean, who knows? I mean, he got a screenplay and producing Oscar nominations. It's not like yeah. he wasn't his name was on the movie, but he didn't direct yeah. it. But I think this is a lot of the bad blood between them is I mean, yes. and apparently right. They were fighting from like week one of production. But then when Chris Noonan, a first time filmmaker, gets his best director nom for this movie, which is so insane that a first time filmmaker got a best director nomination for a children's film released by a studio in August. Then I think George right. Miller started shit talking him more publicly because he was kind of like right. being like, hey, you know, Georgie uh, okay. Porgy had something to do with this. His Just big line is, I served him that movie on a plate. Uh, yes, okay. I believe he literally said that. Right. That he sort of took the okay. movie all the way up to the starting line and then felt like that's this is his interpretation of it. Uh, and then was on right. set every day. And that for Chris Noon to get credit was uh, uh, unjust. And thus started the bad blood between them. Now, Chris Noonan has made that's that's exactly that's the kind of thing you should say with like regret and bitterness, not with pride. Right. I served it to him on a plate. Agreed. You're like, well, it seems like you fucked up. Uh, okay. You're right. Yeah, exactly, right. George. Uh, it's true that Chris Noonan, as you're about to say, Griffin, I think has only made one film since yes. it was his Beatrix Potter biopic, Miss Potter, Ten which years was not later. very good. Eleven years later, yeah. So and, and now, so, and now we are. 10 plus years after that and he still hasn't made another film. He has a couple uh, credits as he, like that's consultant. Right. Yeah. He, so he hasn't not only not directed, Correct. but he has not worked on other films. He has worked on other uh, films no. as a consultant like two okay. since 2006. Yeah, and he's he's done a couple of like TV episodes in Australia. I think that's it. But has not directed another film, got nominated for Best Director for his first film, one follow-up, mm-hmm. out. So yeah. George Miller was really doing the victory laps for this movie. He became, like, the spokesperson for Babe, and he started taking all the credit for it. Okay. And and, and did, that's just important to know going into Babe, Pig, in the City, that that chip is on the shoulder, where because, he's like, yes. I'll show you. That's the thing. The energy of Babe, Pig, in the City is, I want to prove once and for all that I'm the guy responsible for Babe working. Well, that's the thing. This film reeks of a lack of restriction, right? Where it's just like there had to be like numerous times where any normal person watching like the dailies, I'd be like, hey, I think this is real fucked up. But the first movie was a successful and critical hit. So absolutely right. And he like has a strong track record at that point. He's more of an auteur than Chris Noonan is. He's got the reputation. Right. The first movie's a hit and a fucking like Oscar nominee. So they were just like, I don't know. I, who knows why the first Babe worked? Do more of whatever that was. But but the, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Babe does not demand a sequel. No. The ending of Babe is entirely definitive. He has yes. achieved his goal. Perfect He's a sheep pig. Right. And, and exactly. you know what, David, I would say? He doesn't demand a sequel as evidenced by the sequel, where it is literally nothing 
happens. Well, but it's also just, uh, so much. This happens. movie, so much exactly. Happens. This movie is great. It just makes no sense as a sequel to Babe. That would be my take. The, I no. think. I'm sorry, David. This movie is not great. Great <laughs> masterpiece. Let me say, Travis. Travis, you're gonna you have a fight on your hands here. Well, okay. So let me tell you. Because listen, we could talk all day about the bonkers situations, and we will. Mm -hmm. But like structurally, there there is also some problems in the filmmaking itself, I believe, which is the the one that really stands out to my mind. And I think it's because, David, you have the background of Fugly Bloom behind you. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we stand, you know. And so what we see is Fugly locks Babe in a trunk mm. and mutters some words as though they could not afford to pay Mickey Rooney enough to speak <laughs> words. Mickey, Mickey Rooney might not have been in a speaking mood that day. Yeah. I don't know. So he mutters some stuff. Hard cut to a performance in a children's wing of a heart. No explanation. We do not see. We hear like babe say like, hey, you told me that if I did this, I get money. And we cut out any kind of context that might explain to me what has happened. I assumed Fugly Bloom, and maybe I'm supposed to believe this, was going to eat that pig. Sure. But it's no, part of the act he instead, now. He uses the pig, which he has just discovered in his circus <laughs> act that he's performing. Could for you imagine children, being a has, kid and witnessing that? That would rule. That show is the kids, amazing. The kids yeah. are loving it. And already painted on the set is and pig. Mm. How how long had did the other was there another pig that died just before this and they needed to replace <laughs> what, it, what how do they already have an act work what is happening they're performing at a hospital is that right because they're yeah. performing to an audience it's that is all wearing hospital. medical gowns right but then yeah, also the same, old people it's sick kids and old uh, people. sure it's the same hospital that we see later that all the animals are taken to because that's why the kid recognizes Thelonious. Right. They are back in the same hospital that apparently within this hospital, there is like a gala hall and yep. an animal experimentation wing and yes. a children's wing. Hmm. All in this. Now, listen, you tell me there's a, a children's wing in a normal hospital. Hmm. Totally buy it. You tell me there is maybe a gala hall in a hospital. Sure. But all those things. And the animal experimentation. Did you guys notice how the city was like all the cities? Oh, you mean yeah. Metropolis, the city of yeah. Metropolis? Yeah, yeah, I noticed that, <laughs> Ben. I just want to read. Let's backtrack. I want to read no, go here. Ahead, Griffin. This is uh, the downtown skyline of Metropolis. Okay, Fe from the Wikipedia, features numerous landmarks such as the World Trade Center, the Sears Tower, okay. yep. the Chrysler Building, mm -hmm. the Empire State Building, yeah. the IDS Center, mm -hmm. the MetLife Building, the Sydney Opera House, the Hollywood Sign, mm -hmm. the Golden Gate Bridge, the Fernishtum Berlin, Big Ben, Red Square, the Statue of Liberty, the Eiffel Tower, the Christ the Redeemer statue, among others. Good job Why? on the IDS building uh, from mi Minneapolis making it on that list, by the way. But why? Because here's the thing. Because it's also, cool. It is not, David. It's rules. It is not cool. How dare you give credit to that? Because they're also on some kind of like Venetian canal. Correct. For most of the... It's, Don't just say correct. Like, that's a cool thing that doesn't need explaining. And they're also in like Santa Monica because they got a beach. Yeah. And they, yeah, that is 1000%. Uh, that is Venice Beach. I mean, that is Venice Beach. Good that call. Yes. On. Yes. Yes. Here's the thing this is a film that posits that no explanation is needed for Correct. anything. At the beginning of the film, we, we are led to, well, not even the beginning, because we could go all the way back. But at one point in the film, we are led to believe that there is, like, for some reason, hotels are perhaps by law not allowed to have any okay. animals in them to the point where like the animal, whatever capturing group, the whatever worst it is, people in the control, world, they show up like it's a fucking SWAT yeah. sting. That guy ben, in the puffy suit, like the bite suit. They kind of have a bad zoo, uh, bad oh, zoo boy vibe. hundred percent. Right? Yes. They're yeah. bad zoo boys. I, well, like, see, I, I, they're the worst. They're the I worst. think this is the key distinction. Travis is that, Babe is, oh, huh, it's a children's film produced by the Mad Max guy. You can right. see sort of yes. his sensibility 
but there's a different director here. There's a different storytelling style. And it, it's and, like a fairy tale. It's set on a farm. It has right, a simple right. sort of like hero's journey. We, we can grapple with this. But this is very much a children's film directed by the man right. who directed Mad Max. Yes. And it's got the exact same kind of world building, which is stuff is thrown in your face and you are left to sort of extrapolate what you need to from it. Like right. it is it is very Fury Road in sort of the way that you just have to roll with the punches. Exactly. Compare yes. it yes. to Fury Road. Yes, very much so. Like this, it is a world rich with backstory, but we are privy to none of it. And that is in many ways fine with me, an adult whose brain is already broken in so sure. many ways. But for a child and it's just like, hey, just accept the idea of drug dogs, my three-year-old child. And I guess this woman being invasively ex- inspected. Well, I mean, not to, <gasps> not to jump ahead here, but this movie was uh, such a failure upon its release, was lar- largely critically trashed, and was a massive, massive flop. And then its reputation yes. has grown, but almost exclusively with adults now. Like, this is not one of those movies yes. like Willy Wonka, where, like, when it came out, it wasn't a big hit. And then later, both children and adults came to love it. This movie's reputation has been saved by the fact that adults have started watching it. I think no kids like this movie still to this I, day. I don't no. know what a kid would get out of this movie except for nightmares. Nightmares, David. They would get nightmares. Uh, nightmares. It, it is a complete they, failure. They would dream about the hanged dog. Now, Griff, did you yeah. see this film when it came out? I did not. I did not see this film until probably about five years ago on Netflix. I did not see it when it came out. Uh, we will have done or will be soon doing a Babe episode on Patreon, but I rewatched both of these movies back to back last night because I really wanted the uh, cognitive dissonance the of these two films next to each other. Yes. Yeah. Especially since uh, that's funny because I watched Babe Pig in the City and then Whiplash back sure. to back just so I could be able to compare them. Also two. a good Whiplash. Yeah. Whiplash, one of the better Whiplashes. Yeah. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, I, I forgot a that this movie literally starts like five minutes after the original Babe ends, but immediately yep. you can tell you're yeah. in a different fucking movie. Um, <laughs> yes, but but rewatching Babe uh, w- when the first Babe came out, I was uh, six or seven years old, I think six years old, 95. Uh, 95. And uh, I was uh, terrified of death. And Babe was this movie that everyone loved. My mom was like, we got to go see this thing. People say it's the best kids movie in years. And she took me to see it. And death looms so large over that entire film. That rewatching it, I remembered so vividly how much I hated that film in the theaters. I, I don't remember Death Looming Wait. Large. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say more so than Pig in the Well, City. this is the difference. I think as a child, weirdly, I would have had less triggers with Pig in the City, which has this like very ominous tone. But babe, yes. the death is very explicit. Like it's so much about what is the purpose of a pig? You're going to be eaten. He's sure. constantly avoiding uh, yeah being okay, slaughtered yes. right, right, his right. mother gets killed at the beginning it's kind of bambi-ish in that sort of sense that it's like very much about the immediate threats within a very small world like the farm is pretty idyllic but death is constantly around the corner whereas being like, taken the city is welcome to death city everything is death <laughs> Yes, right. let me, if I may, there is a very troubling existential moment in Babe Pig in the City which I want to discuss mm-hmm. literally existential where Babe is being chased by two dogs mm-hmm. and the narrator describes what's going on in Babe's head where the flashes of his brief life like click through his head and he just stops running and turns around and says, why? I would That's like to read the, the direct the dog quote. knocks him and it's, Wait, it's I, I, basically... Like every human being's experience of after a while, you just get shit on so much that you're like, why am I doing any of this? Griffin, and then I, he gets knocked in the water. I'm Go going ahead, to read please. the direct quote. Yes. Because this okay. is, I was yes. thinking during this, like, you know, uh, uh, th- throwing back to the trivia days of yore. Mm. If in a trivia round, in a movie trivia night, someone said, I'm going to read a quote, name the movie. Would anyone guess Babe Pig in the City for this? Something broke beyond the terror, flickerings, fragments of his short life, the random events that delivered him to this, his moment of annihilation. As terror gave way to exhaustion, 
Babe, you would mute that word for trivia night. Yeah. Turned to his attacker, his eyes filled with one simple question. Why? Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. <laughs> All right. So I want to take it back here. What I was going to say is, d- did not see this movie when it came out in theaters because... Right. Even though I probably was no longer traumatized by the first one, by the point this came out, I still yeah. had less fondness for it than most children of right. my generation. And then on top of it, this one looked bug nuts and everyone right. hated it. And I was like, skip, easy pass. And then over years and years and years, it started to get more and more of a cult following. It, within 1998, the only two people who really liked it were Siskel and Ebert. And Ebert said it was Siskel said it was his film of the year. He it was his film, it the film of his of the year. year. The last year he was alive. <laughs> yeah. He named this film he of the year out. and then died. He went out on Babe Pig in the City. Right. I mean, like, like a month later. <laughs> Ebert was like, this movie is great. And I think it's better than Babe. And Siskel was like, shut the fuck up, you pansy. It's not only great and better than Babe. It's the best movie in a year that includes like the thin red line and out yeah. of sight. And like, this is the last movie I ever want to see. Saving Private Ryan. Like, this is yeah. my movie this year. And then Gene Siskel dropped the mic on life. <laughs> yeah, he did. He announced that Siskel Babe out. Pig in the City was his number one film of 1998 and then left the mortal realm. Um, so, did you see this when it came out, David? Uh, I did, and I have very little memory of it. And I'm pretty sure I was just a kid who saw movies. I was must have yeah. been, I don't know, 12 years old when this came out, right? 98. Was, yeah, 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 yeah. And so I was just like, yeah, sure. And I remember seeing it, thinking it was stupid, but I was also very like anti sequel at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what I mean? Those, huh? I was like, it's a sequel. Those are dumb. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, original films. That's what I like. You were destined to become a film critic. By right. the way, you were 12. And so I didn't really think about it much. And then I remember Noah Baumbach programming it with eyes wide shut uh, at the Metrograph like four or yeah. five years ago. When the Metrograph and, opened, they let him yeah. program any double feature he wanted, the Metrograph Theater here in New York. And that was his choice, was Babe Pig in the City on a double feature with Eyes Wide Shut. Right. Two movies nice. about exploring a weird artificial nightmare city as a sort of dark night in the soul. And these sort of plucky, mm-hmm. like optimistic yes. figures who think they are in control of their realm, master of their domain, dropped into a hostile city and and realizing that they are like the naive. They are both babes. Yes, they are stuck babes in, a in city. the wood. Well yeah. done. You also and could yes. say it's like uh, both movies, it's about how rich people are bad. Uh, correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. I had in my head a memory that this movie was at least weird and I knew its reputation. I have not seen Babe since theaters, mm-hmm. so I do not remember Babe very well. I remember that it ends with him saying that'll do pig. Spoiler alert. A slam dunk. <laughs> oh. moment. Whoa. It is a slam dunk moment. Yeah, right. Um, per- perhaps one of the most like referenced children's movie moments like. Since it right. came out, I think everyone under, even if they've never seen Babe, if you say that'll do, pig, people are like, I, like it. I know what that is. I know what that is. Yes. It's yeah. part and, of the cultural lexicon. Yeah. Right. And a line delivery yes. that earned James Cromwell, a legendary character actor, his only Oscar nomination. Right. I mean, that yes. isn't disputable. Really? And so I remember that I flick on this movie. And it begins just to say with, uh, you know, uh, Babe has is a successful sheepdog. They've gotten lots of prizes. Everything's going great. And then Babe mm-hmm. accidentally drowns and crushes his, his owner. Yeah. And, and here's the thing, folks, if you haven't seen it, you hear that and you're like, well, what happens between there? Nothing. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> that is the first 30 seconds of the movie. And so I guess my thesis going into this is like if babe is about like realizing you know growing up and realizing the person you want to be right and achieving that like he wants to be a sheep pig Uh that's that's the thing he knows he's made to do it 
he he charges at that goal and he figures it out. So George mm-hmm. Miller is like, yeah, all right, kid, you figured out what you want to do. But unfortunately, now you have to live life and life is brutal. And like it, there's tax men and there's prostitutes and there's Mickey Rooney. Like there's going to be people at every Whoa, corner. Wait. Who are the prostitutes? Who are the prostitutes? Something's David? going on with those chimpanzees. Oh, OK. I would have accepted the poodle or the answer. poodles. Okay. The, the poodle who says that people have taken advantage of her and used her. And I think that's what we're supposed to glean from that. By right. The way. That was just I mean, as someone who didn't love the original babe at the time, but knew that everyone else loved it, seeing the trailer for this movie, a I think I had a little bit of the thing you did, David, where I was like, ah, sequels, you know, the matching returns, whatever. And right. then this movie looked from the trailers so much goofier than the first film, which is a very stylized, heightened film, but also has this kind of like austere farm life. It stars a stoic character actor. It's a, it has humans. Whereas this movie is like, forget right. the humans. We are as little as them as possible. Like this is well, animal I also, first. Yeah. There's also this distinction where it's like Babe is a very stylized movie that takes place in a somewhat Mm -hmm. recognizable world. The performances, the visuals are like heightened. It has all the George Miller like wide angle lenses and the like chiaroscuro lighting and uh, the weird fever dream quality. But the story is very, very straightforward. Uh, and, and nothing that happens in the film is wildly outside of the realm of what could happen in real world. Even right. when Babe actually yes. like herds the dogs or the sheep rather. That's like an impressive, that's like an impressive animal exactly. trick you might see on YouTube. Exactly. These days. And that's yeah. the final moment of the first film. And then the second movie starts and there's this like heroes welcome victory parade for Farmer Hoggett that immediately you can tell you're in a different universe. Like, it suddenly feels like you're in fucking Dr. Seuss land. And there are people skywriting ham, which then gets corrected to champ. Yes. That's how you skywrite ham. You gotta start from the middle of the word and then build out. Yeah, you work your way out. You get two planes to do it at the same (laughs) time. Because what else are you going to do, You start at the 20% mark. You go right. up to 80, uh-huh. then you get a second uh-huh. plane and you circle back to zero and to 80 to fill in the rest. The recurring thing in this film that I think kept throwing me is there are there are very few, if any, anchor points in which one might grab onto to give you some frame of like normalcy. Because like even in the far, like as you said, David, in, in the first one, there's a lot more human point right it's like the human world is normal and then you go to the animals and there's this whole other society that we're learning about whereas in this one not only are the humans also pretty wacky they're like in there is one point where the woman who owns the hotel just leaves for the majority of the movie and it's just like hey this building's now all animals <laughs> and it's like what is it, happening? it is this thing of like and this was the thing i remember recognizing when the trailers came up which it's like okay first of all it seems like james cromwell is not in this movie at all so not only is right. this film mm-hmm. less focused Correct. on humans you're remo- removing the one human who impossibly got an academy award nomination for this movie so already george miller is like Look, if you love Babe, you're in good hands. I was the real auteur. I'm going to give you everything you want for pure Babe. First of all, we're getting rid of the actor you all liked. He's kaput. He's at the bottom of the well 10 minutes in. Not only are we getting rid of him. Was that him? We're mutilating him. Yeah, I just assumed that was Cromwell saying like, hey, I don't want to fucking do this. (laughs) Hey, uh, I did the one pig movie and I read Cromwell's uh, random rules feature from the AV Club, which was from some years ago. And he said uh, he seemed like he was very much team Chris Noonan during the production of Babe, that he felt very protective Mm. of Chris Noonan as uh, George Miller was trying to wrestle control of the film. Uh, He didn't say that he asked to be in Pig in the City less, but I could understand how maybe George Miller could feel less inclined to bring him back. And he, to his credit, said... George Miller was very pleasant in the second film. I only had a nice experience with him, but I thought he was a real bully on the first movie. Wow. It's so crazy how traumatic that first movie was. 
I know, and he's like, and like I had a great experience. It was a lovely film. I, I'm so proud of that performance. It was pretty magical. It was six months of my life. It was such a different like work experience than I've had. But George Miller was a bully, and the film was kind of terrible from that one perspective. Can you guys imagine how much different the final action sequence would have been in this movie if it had been Cromwell bouncing around a ballroom like with his inflatable pants and like his bouncy <laughs> suspenders. And it was just him bouncing from column to column trying to catch that. You pig. mean when he, George Miller essentially remakes the master blaster battle from beyond Thunderdome? Hell yeah. In a high society well. party with animals and an old lady. <laughs> well, that, hey, also, once again, just from filmmaking point of view, the smashing into the champagne cups never pays off. It made me so mad. The, the actress who plays Mrs. Hoggett in this film uh, was like an Australian sketch comedy sitcom actress. Uh, she was 33 years old when filming <laughs> The First Babe. What? Which means she's 35 in this one. You're right. She, you're absolutely she right. Is. My God, that is a, no offense to one me. year younger than me. Because Cromwell no was, I think, 55 and she was 33. Right. Cromwell was 32 or 33. Yeah. Yeah. He's Cromwell is like 80 now. Yes. Um, here's the other thing that's weird and not that important, but kind of odd is that Christine Kavanaugh, the voice of Chucky from Rugrats voiced babe in the first babe. Mm -hmm. And this time Miller was like, get me a different rug rat. Get me Tommy. Get me E.G. Daly. Like, I, well, because Christine Kavanaugh asked for too much money. Is that the reason? I don't know. She also kind of half retired after that because I feel like she stopped playing Chucky as well huh. around okay. this time. Okay. She, she dies like 2012. I always thought she died earlier because she sort of moved away from working. I don't know if it was money. I don't know if it was just a career shift thing. Because her leaving Rugrats as well is kind of weird. But there is that thing, aside from the fact that you're, like, getting rid of Cromwell, there's also the thing that the first movie, and and, and you're changing the voice of Babe, right? You're, like, disrupting the main yeah. two performances from the first film that people right. connected to emotionally. Uh, the first Babe kind of operates on, like, George Orwell animal farm logic. Where yes, it's like the yes. animals are never doing anything that an animal couldn't do in real life. If you were a human witnessing this from the outside, right. you would not hear their dialogue, but their right. physical behavior would seem normal. And it's just about how sort of societal, like human thoughts are imposed onto animal behavior. Yes. We just and don't then, know that they're yes. talking to each other. Right. 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 There's and there's a lot of like, oh, what you never realize is this is what the animals talk about right. when you're not around. Kind of classic right. talking animal rules. And then right. the Babe Pig in the City trailer, when you go like, Babe sounds different. James Cromwell's nowhere to be seen. And now apparently fully dressed chimpanzees live in a flop house. <laughs> <laughs> And, and also, the orangutan throughout the movie is disgusting. Yes. Yes. Dis Menacing. I kept waiting for him to murder somebody. Felonious monkey? Yes. <laughs> At the end, when he is helping uh, the, the lady hang her clothing, I'm like, he's going to murder Cromwell and take over as like her husband. That guy is creepy. You me cannot out. get a read on this guy's allegiances. You do not know yeah. where Felonious monkey's allegiances lie. Well, so this is the thing, and as you're talking about, like the, one of the differences I realized between Babe and Babe Pig in the City is one of the fascinating things. I think one of the things that made Babe work is that Babe, the character, is is I mean, admittedly, fairly passive. Like things keep happening around him in the first movie, so you're looking at him interact with the sheep, you're looking at him interact with the two dogs, and you're watching like him grow into being more confident. And being good at this thing and the relationships that form, right? And then it also is like, not only are we doing away with the societal part of like, we're in a farm or you're learning about how these animals interact. Now you also are like, hey, you remember those two dogs that were like his parents where he earned the love of the dad? They're out. <laughs> hey, remember those sheep that he worked with? that he let? They're out. And it was just like, even the, the duck, yeah. Ferdinand, 
doesn't come into like the th- back to the third act Siskel's of the movie. Siskel's only complaint, so I believe, was like, more duck. <laughs> I love that I mean, duck. Right? Yeah. That's the thing. Is Ferdinand, like, no, they, no they, joke, they, honks in this movie. Uh, <laughs> yes. But they just like removed every, yes. hey, like, you know how you liked all of these things from the first one? Get them the fuck out. But we know your favorite thing is them singing mice. We kept those babies. Well, but not to repeat myself, that's what's most astonishing about this movie is that it jettisons almost everything that people reacted to most strongly in the first film. But the movie is also yes. very clearly the director saying, let me prove to you that I'm responsible for the first movie being good. Right. Yes. Bring, 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 bring. Oh. The phone's ringing. Oh, my God. Wait a second. I think someone is uh, Zoom bombing us again. Uh, let's accept this Zoom bomb. Okay, let's accept this request here in virtual nice. Hmm. Can't make it out. It's it's kind of blurry. Sort of a moan. It's like a yeah. purple blob. I think maybe the camera's out of focus. I don't know what's going on here. Grimace. Oh, it's it's oh, grimace. it's not. It's actually perfectly in focus. We are now on Zoom the, with the big purple the, blob, the famous himself, yeah, in, indeterminate purple creature, mm, grimace, who I believe is a, a, a milkshake fan. Yeah, I, right? He, he likes milkshakes. He started out, I believe, as a villain. I think canonically, he was. He was like a milkshake thief. He was like a I monster. He was like a milkshake monster. He was maybe a sentient. Sort of milkshake grimace. Yeah, he seems to be agreeing with that. Oh, right. He only says grimace. Is that uh, is that part of the? I deal? think so. From my memory, yeah. Grimace. Can you confirm okay, or deny that? Grimace. Right. So he was a milkshake monster, and then he was popular. So they made him sort of an ally of Ronald McDonald. I think he might have been green at first, even. All right. So I mean, let's. That's that, and we've summarized who grimace is, and, and that's the end of this interruption. Grimace. I but now he's a beautiful purple, and I gotta say, grimace looks really tired. You know, a lot of us are having our sleep schedules disrupted by this uh, COVID-19. It's, it's a weird time. Yeah, very weird. We time all have sleep. rolling panic. And I got to say, Grimace has some some real Simsy and bags under his eyes right now. <laughs> and even darker purple around his eyes. Well, he's got a very unusual. I'm not and I don't mean this to shame him, but his body has an unusual shape. Sure. Yeah. He's sort of a. So he is sort of a pear shaped. He is person. chunky. Like his whole Can body we say is it? Can we shaped. say it? He is chunky. Uh sure. He's and a bit like, of a thick you know, king. As a, as, as a slightly thick king myself, uh-huh. I I will say like there's this uh, mattress from our friends at Purple. Oh, our friends at patented, Purple. A patented comfort technology that adapts to your body's natural shape instantly. Interesting, because you, as okay. you said, that's a weird shape. Most No no judgment, Grimace. Grimace. But most mattresses would not be sort of designed to support that sort of body. Yeah, and like, you know, even a lot of mattresses, I think they take a while to, to sort of adapt to your body and to your sleep style. Purple, it's right away. It's for every body, no matter how you sleep, because it's designed with these 2,800 open air channels. Oh. And a naturally temperature neutral gel so you'll never sleep too hot or too cold that would actually help because grimace i think sweats a lot and when he sweats it smells like when you eat very mcdonald's in your car you know that smell i do i yeah. do it's a, yes I and do then you leave the smell. bag there and then uh, you like the next time someone yeah, gets in your an car oily smell i know this right. obviously as someone who drives a lot <laughs> Uh, well, purple mattress. It's soft where you want it. It's firm where you need it. It's comfortably cool all over. They they sent some squishy purple products to us. I'm sort of squishing them for the yeah. It's right so now. much fun. They sent us just uh, literally just a, a sample. And usually when people send us sample, a grid. right? This a is literally grid. just. It's like a stress toy. It's like a purple grid. And I gotta say, it's fun to play with. It's fun to mush around in your hands. Can you imagine how good it feels underneath your back and head? Well, it's giving you, you know, it gives you some support, yeah. but then also it's a nice, nice sort of squishy gift. David and I are both, for the listener at home, we're both literally pressing it against our cheeks and leaning against it. And it is, we it are. is very comfy. Uh, the Grimace. Oh, what is Grimace saying? Uh, I just remembered just... I can speak in full sentences. I looked it up on the Wikipedia. And I just want to say that uh, a thing I like about the, this pitch for uh, 
This is purple. incredible. Yeah, I know. I forgot. I, th- I had to go to the mcdonalds.fandom.com to double check. And yes, in fact, I started out as an evil milkshake monster and then became good. And I speak in full sentences and those sentences always start with duh. Those are things we all know that I now remember. But I was going to say... A thing I've always disliked about mattresses is they make my weird color stand out too much. Well, Grimace, I understand that because I, of course, sleep on a mattress that is the exact same color as my skin, pasty white. All right. I benefit from being a mattress color boy, but Grimace, yes, this is a mattress that is very close to your natural hue. You guys can count on resting easy night after night, year after year, because the ultra wearable purple grid is not going to sink or lose shape, and they're so confident in what they do that every purple mattress comes with free shipping and returns and a risk-free 100-night trial. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Duh. Do you know that originally I had four arms so I could steal milkshakes? That's weird. And then yeah, more, more for stealing. Later they streamlined me to duh, only two arms. Well, that's a, that's a weird thing to be true about a person. Yeah, anyway, tell me some weird true things about purple mattresses. Well... You can experience the next evolution of sleep by going to purple.com slash check using promo code check. For a limited time, you'll get $150 off any purple mattress order of $1,500 or more. That's purple.com slash check promo code check for $150 off any mattress order of $1,500 or more. Terms apply. Uh, do, Do you know that according to the McDonald's Wikia, Grimace was last seen at Dodger Stadium on July 18, 2012 versus the Philadelphia Phillies dancing to Ram Jam's 1977 classic, Black Betty. Here's my call to action. Go to purple.com backslash check, order a purple mattress, and then while you already have your browser open, someone go to mcdonalds.fandom.com and edit the wikia to mention that this is my most recent appearance now. Okay. Yes, I, I hope someone will do that. Bye. Um, to get uh, back into the plot, after Babe yeah. mutilates uh, <laughs> Farmer Hoggett by dropping him into a well and then dropping a giant piece of machinery onto his head. I um, mean, a really ominous sequence with the yes. sort of aesthetics and the tone of Daniel Plainview down the well in the beginning of oh, There Will Be Yes, sure. yeah. Exactly what I was thinking yes. of. Yeah. And, and Especially with the narration in there of like the pig would wander for years if only right. if and I was like Jesus Christ. that yeah it's all insane and in in a movie that in the first Babe you probably would just need him bonking his head uh, yes. Miller is just sort of like let's just bring this up to eleven so that I'm a happens. doctor I'm going to show you serious injuries exactly exactly so Hog gets out so the yeah. farm can't pay its bills so the taxmen mm-hmm. come and Esme played by first build Magda Subansky uh, <laughs> decides to take Babe to a far away sheepdog herding contest right isn't so, it isn't it an that's appearance not important. Yeah, it's like he's going to yes, get an appearance, an appearance fee, fee and they just yeah. they only get trapped in the city because like that's like their connecting flight or whatever. Like that's the only yes, reason they're right. in the city at all. He's not trying yeah. to get to the city. Right. No, this fucking do- drug sniffing dog. Yeah, a, a real narc. Which like this is this other weird thing is, you know, as we're saying, like the first babe is like you understand a farm. It's a small contained space. We know how animals exist on a farm. Animals have roles on a farm. We're transposing that onto like the internal life of the animals and how they would treat it like a job. But we understand the whole movie is based on the fact that like a pig doesn't uh, herd sheep. That's not what happens here. And then this movie then makes the transition to, okay, here are animals who have jobs. This is like in the real world, a real animal that has a real job and what kind of attitude would he have? So already you're like, this is odd to see Mrs. Hoggett and Babe in this like terrifying modernist airport. It feels off-putting. It feels like it's immediately abandoning the entire energy of the first movie. But you understand like, okay, yeah, so Babe could meet a drug-sniffing dog or a bomb-sniffing dog and he could think like, take his job very seriously, but also not understand why everyone responds to him so strongly. That's kind of a fun conceit that he just thinks the barking is like a party trick to get the attention. And he doesn't understand that that's what does in Mrs. Hoggett and Babe. 
because so much of Babe is the Babe is this innocent. He doesn't understand anything. Everyone he meets teaches him a little something about the world. And in part, Babe ends up teaching them. But uh, right. Yeah. This is like it dooms him. They end up uh, pulling Mrs. Hoggett. Uh, she is for because she is smuggling drugs. Right. In like uh, this very terrifying, like interrogated by like uh, seemingly, I don't know. They look like CIA officials. Yes. And and I, I, I not to nitpick, but if I may, may I nitpick for a moment? You may. I, you may. Thank you. The idea uh, I fly a lot, do a lot of conventions and a lot of uh, tours. <coughs> Humble brag. You do not. They do not make you go to baggage claim and get your baggage and then check your baggage again to get on a connecting flight. Yes. That is not how that works. No. And yet that is what trips her up. Is she's waiting for the pig to come through baggage claim so she can go get on another flight. No, no, no. I call foul. Well, it, well hey, hey don't call, call foul until Ferdinand. Ferdinand shows up. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. Making the same trip. We're rushing to the same thing. All right, but then all right. it sets up this thing of, okay, so now she's missed her flight. There's no other flight for her to get on. They're stuck waiting at the airport. And now the film reveals this element that the rest of the world outside of this farm is so aggressively hostile to animals. Yes. That within yes. this airport, she has no place she can stay. Everyone's kicking her out. She tries to bundle it up as a baby. She doesn't know what to do. She's stuck. Looking for somewhere to stay until I guess the next flight is the next day. Is that the idea? Yeah. She's looking for a one night stay. And then one of the weirdest conceits in this movie, a man comes up to her and recommends to her this one hotel in the city. And then the narrator says, who knows why this kind man offered this advice. And he, the man turns around a camera and he looks exactly like a pig. There is a running thing yep. in this movie that every yes. once in a while, the only acts of kindness that are done from human to human in this film happen <laughs> by people who have been cursed to look exactly like pigs and take some pity right. on Hoggett. And this babe. happens like three times in the film. There's like a judge. Yeah. Is that not the same person? Different I people. It was the same person. Is what they were. They're different people. Jesus it's Christ. just more like no, no, it's no. like, OK, look, here's what life is like. There's a big city. Then there's a bunch of farms. OK, yeah. in the big city, people live their lives. You got all it looks like, you know, a, a party 24 seven. There's, there's rollerblading people. punks. Exactly. It's it's right. It's yeah. your, it's Venice Beach circa 1998. But there's buckets also, of glue. And there's animal hotels and, you know, don't try and go to the airport, blah, blah, blah. And if you try and check into a hotel with a pig, you're cursed, obviously. But sure. there are also it, pig people. Is it a hotel, though? Because it seems like they, they're living. Yeah, sure. It's a residential hotel, I suppose you could call it. Boarding house. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's a boarding house. That's yeah. what it feels like to me. But, right. Uh, right, the second they get to the city proper, when they leave the airport, and you first see the skyline and then you go in and the skyline immediately stands out as like these are, you know, as we said, landmarks that are not usually in the same image. Something weird's going on here. And then they cut into this weird Venice street corner. Yeah, it looks like the premiere of the Phantom Menace red carpet or whatever. <laughs> like it's so incongruous. And the movie just divorces all reality at this point. It goes yeah. like, this is not Babe Pig in a city. There's a reason we didn't name it Babe Pig in New York. We decided that the city this film takes place in is every city all at once. If Coruscant is the whole planet is a city, this is the whole city is all cities. Yes, but here's, right. here's what I will say, though, just from a design standpoint. Uh, I sure. don't know if you guys know this. I have done some professional scenic design for theater. And so mm. I get really hung up on like scenic design. And if you look at like the Venice beat, like I was sorry, the Venice canal area, right? The canals. Mm -hmm. It's a very specific design where you're like, oh, oh this yeah. is a soundstage where they built this. It doesn't necessarily, it kind of looks like the canals by Venice beach. It kind of yep. looks like actual Venetian canals, but it is very general and specific at the same time. But when they go, to, when she goes to that beach, that is so one for one Venice Beach that it's like, oh, you didn't build a set for that one. You went on location for that one. So you went it, from it, soundstage to on location and it looks like it's lit two different ways. It looks like two different set. It is 
upsetting visually to me because it is like she wandered off set and they just started filming outside the studio. And I hate I want to see if I can find this, but I think this film was like the largest exterior set ever made. Uh, the main sort of uh, Venetian cityscape. Um, but uh, this is one of those insane uh, film production stories where it was like, not only was it like one of the biggest and most expensive sets that was ever made, and that was its own cost and time and energy, but I, I think it was filmed in Australia. I think the beach isn't Venice Beach. I think it's somewhere in Sydney. But... Um, they, there wasn't a soundstage big enough to realize the set they wanted. So they were building a soundstage in order to then build the set on the soundstage. Like they it had was to create. In, it was shot in Australia, yes. Entirely. Yeah. They had to create a studio large enough to then create the largest set ever. So they were like, it was the cost of building the facility and then building the set on the facility. Jeez. I think they took some run down place and had to like rebuild it and expand it in order to build that set. But the movie is, it's one of those things where it's just like, it is much like Eyes Wide Shut, where when the film came out, everyone was like, this movie is supposed to be New York, is shot in London, and it looks nothing like New York, and it feels nothing like New York, and it's an abject failure at representing New York. And Scorsese was one of the first people to go like, he's Stanley Kubrick. Like, if it doesn't look like New York and it doesn't seem like New York, that's intentional. He could have made a fake New York and London if that's what he wanted to do. And I think part of the conceit that George Miller is doing here is like, this is a city that actually defies logic where you can oscillate between things that look like real locations and look like sets that it, it, terrains that don't make sense within a mile of each other travis is is scrunching up his face he's making a no no stinky poo poo face it's because that kind of, what you're saying there is one it's bonkers to me to compare george miller and stanley kubrick but two D no bombback did it you can't say like because I'm a genius, this works. <laughs> like you can't, That's not a good logical argument. Well, you see, the reason this works is I'm right. <laughs> like, well, I know. I think it is. I think he's trying to create a city that is so thoroughly overwhelming that it has to be every city all at once. Yes, but I think the problem is, is right now the re I, and listen. I I hate to argue with you guys. You know, I love you guys so much. But love you too. The, the I think the reason I can't process this movie in such a way that I enjoy it is that it asks me to accept that everything is bonkers. Like there is no. OK, for example, the woman who runs this hotel, mm -hmm. right, if she was more normal. She's that, an odd lady. Let's be right. honest. And from the beginning, I once again, when she seems to be cons uh, conspiring with Fugly that they are both going to kill the pig or something. But if she had come across as very sweet and genuine, I would have been like, oh, this represents like the same thing the farm is, which is this is like this oasis of kindness. Uh, but instead she's bonkers. And she's like, but you can't trust anybody in the city. But that's the thing. That's is, kind I, of the take. Right. But that's the thing is I want it to be, you can't trust anyone, but this person. And that's why she is so unhappy and she doesn't fit in. Right. Sure. But like in, instead, it's just like uh, like the world is is bonkers. The characters are bonkers. We never get one single solitary line of explanation as to why everyone hates animals so much. Like, it's just like you accept that everything is bonkers all the time. But because everything is bonkers, there's no solid like stand here and just look around at all the bonkers things I've made. Everything is so topsy turvy that I can't gain perspective <laughs> on how wonderfully bonkers everything is. We're all smiling as you monologue because we're all like, yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, it makes it sound awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I need one, I need one piece of ground that I can it stand babe. upon. Babe is not. Babe is a he's, shitty character. He's super grounded. He's a super grounded chill dude. He's got a spike collar. He's a maximum and it, killer. And it looks like a toupee. 
<laughs> he yeah. does look like he's a Yeah, type. I've, why does he have the little the little wig? He he has it in the first movie too. What's up with his little like tufty hair? I I think it's to make him look unique. I mean, there's like you know yeah. so many like animal films have like, and this is the one special animal. They got this one weird d- d- differentiating uh, visual. I think it's also to make him stand out, but it's not like there are a lot yeah. of other pigs in either of these movies. Right. It's guy. It's fairly. This is a really weird movie, guys. I, I, also, I, I, none I'm of the sorry. other animals know what he is. <laughs> yeah. No. Which is no one weird. is. No one is. But like, I guess it's like a city animal thing. No, but even on the farm that. in the original movie, I feel like no, they know him better. It's in this one, right? This is the one where no one understands what species he is. Hey, can I ask you guys an off-topic right. question? Well, yeah. I mean, it's on topic because we're talking about Babe in the City. But aside from Babe and any of the original uh, farm animals, who's your favorite animal character in this movie? Oh, that's a mm. tough question. I mean, you're uh, talking about me, some of my best friends of all time. I know, I know. And I'm making, <laughs> I'm making you choose. It's like choose a child, you know? Um, For me, it's... It's definitely the bull terrier, you know, the the, the, oh. the mean dog who becomes a nice dog. Okay. I actually, I my, I do love that writing wise, that mean dog's like, listen, I'm a mean dog. I'm not going to start being nice. <laughs> it's just that I owe you. And I recognize yeah. that. I want you to know I would still, if you hadn't saved my life, I'd be killing you right now. <laughs> hey, Travis. Yeah. Thank the pig. Thank the pig. Thank the pig. <laughs> Oh God, that scene is crazy. Gee, all right, we need to keep going. Uh, but Chris, no, come on, I want to know animal. Griffin's favorite animal. My favorite animal. I mean, obviously, I'm a flea lick guy. Yeah, He's right in my I knew, wheelhouse. I knew you were yeah, say yeah, 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 yeah. See, for me, it's the nameless, voiceless capuchin monkey who just seems to be there whenever they need someone with hands and thumbs or whatever. Oh yeah, he's a rapscallion. He does steal. I love he him. Does. And he's in yeah. a kilt. Oh, I enjoy him. Immensely. I know, right? Oh, that it, was a good choice that, for him. Costume is that wise. your guy, Ben? The the monkey yeah. as well? Or? Yeah, 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 that makes yep. sense. Yep. My favorite performance is uh, Bob the Chimpanzee, played by Stephen Wright. Deadpan alt comedian Stephen Wright. I but that's another that thing. Right, but like, uh, to, to go like, it's 1998, it's the sequel to Babe. You, you're adding more animals, more speaking roles, more voiceover parts. The first movie is mostly like it's Hugo Weaving and yep. Miriam Margolis. But now, like you're going into this film, it's a blockbuster. You could get any actors you want. Who are your two big name actors? Uh, Glenn Heady and Stephen Wright are your two big and name Adam voiceover Goldberg. actors. Adam Goldberg, the same year as Saving Private Ryan. And then most of the rest of the cast is voiceover artists. Yep. Like cartoon voiceover artists. That's the yep. moment for me where the film, like, when you go to Venice, it gets 10 degrees crazier in the same way that when you go to the airport, it gets 10 degrees crazier in the same way that the parade gets 10 degrees crazier than the original babe. But the moment where the film just immediately goes, this takes place in upside down bug nuts banana world <laughs> is when they're going through the uh, boarding home and they get to the door with the chimpanzees and they're fully dressed in a fully furnished apartment watching TV. Yes. And the monkeys fully behave like human beings. <sighs> the most disturbing moment in the movie for me is so we've just watched, it's not even the dog hanging and drowning and clearly dying and then somehow being resurrected through Babe's love. No, it is right after that when then suddenly, seemingly out of the woodwork, about 20 other animals that we have not seen previously show up and treat babe like the literal savior and they're like will you please help us other animal and then they all line up as one by one they get like a jelly bean out of a jar great scene and he's a street king oh and they thank the pig and they, thank, they gotta thank that pig thank the pig thank, thank the pig, the pig. So, right. George Miller is like, look, in the city, might makes right. And you're just going to have to learn that. And it's a tough lesson that you have to learn. But that doesn't mean you can you have to you can let go of your, you know, your in, your kindness, your inherent empathy for life. Right. Like well, that's, that's sort of the crucial yes. moment in the middle of the movie. Babe is more passive than this character. And he doesn't have 
a. He doesn't have a goal. Like in no, the first movie, he he's like, I want philosophy. to be a sheep yeah, pig. This right. is what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Right. But he is one of those Paddington type characters where it's like the the key to Babe is that everyone who meets him gets a little bit changed by him. He's not a piece of like, shit. Right, right. That that he just is sort of so steadfast in his beliefs, or at least is so sort of open in his earnestness that he makes people question the structures that they previously believed in. And in the original film, it's like, maybe you could be nice to sheep rather than yell at them. And in this film, it's like power structures yeah. within a city. It's like right. a mob enforcer pit bull. Right. So maybe I can make, Maybe I can make this pig a made man. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Yes. Yes. Like that jelly bean scene is like line up and kiss the ring. Like yes. I have anointed this guy as the new dawn of the city. And Babe's just like, oh, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And so if I may pick up the plot for a moment, please, it now takes yet another harsh turn in plot wise where they're like, OK, I think I see. It. Nope. Um, because then the across the street neighbors who we have not introduced before this moment call mm -hmm. the like animal police because they're disturbing their animal uh, SWAT team. The like animal said, SWAT honestly. team. They are listening to an opera and mm -hmm. uh, the, the animals are somehow disturbing this. And so the animal SWAT rolls up and starts choking animals and putting them in nets, including the uh, sudden appearance of chimp babies. You're missing a key detail here. We're jumping over a big point, which is she's supposed to fly out the next day. Oh, right. But right. while she's checking in and a uh, kooky hotel animal lady is giving her the tour, Fugly Flume discovers Babe. Uh, Fugly and, Flume played and, by Mickey Rooney. Of course, legendary Hollywood actor Mickey Rooney. Uh, and yeah, who only him, lived for said. only lived for sixteen more years after this movie. Whew. Do you think? Do you think while making this film, Mickey Rooney? Because I really couldn't decide. Do you think on set he was like, "I was Mickey Rooney. I was the biggest star in Hollywood. God damn it!" And now I'm playing Fugly Flume and Babe too. Or do you think he was looking around the set and going like? Finally, a picture the way we used to make them. <laughs> I think it's that second one, Griffin. Some animals Jesus. wearing little clothes, walking on their hind legs. I get this. <laughs> this makes sense to me. <laughs> he was 15 years removed from his honorary Oscar. He just kept working. Yeah. I know. He's yeah. got zero human dialogue in this film. I mean, he just is drunkenly slurring and mumbling. Yeah, he just whispers, his, basically. His pants honk. His pants do wrong. He is his whisked off to the hospital. So basically that, that scene plays out where it's the chimps and the orangutan and uh and babe and uh fugly performing at a children's hospital. It all goes wrong because babe is in the wrong place at the wrong time again. And then cut to Fugly being wheeled off on a gurney. Dead. Are the, yes. Are those two things connected? Well, his business is ruined because the whole set burned no, down. No, I understand that. But he was he seemed to be OK at the end of that scene. And then later, Thelonious says, I tried to wake him and he wouldn't wake up. I think the accident at the hospital and him being wheeled off of the gurney are two separate events. Well, on Wikipedia, it claims that he is in a food coma. <laughs> oh, I don't know why. It, do, I don't, it doesn't explain how he got in a food coma. Babe well, also fired a, a cannon at his a lot of food. Yeah, yeah right. that's, that's true. true. That's true. Uh, I think he might have died of a broken heart, you know, because the act went so poorly that day. Sure, sure, sure. He's so a consummate no, professional. Right, yeah, right. right. He hates to give uh, a crowd less than 110%. Uh, right. But this sets up the closest thing this movie has to a plot, which is uh, Mrs. Hoggett and Babe are separated. Yeah. And she's got to find Babe. And right, babe is kind of like on his own. Right, right. She goes out wandering the city trying to find babe in the process, angers a biker gang who then attacks a, a bunch of cops who look like the cops from the first Mad Max. Yes. Uh, yeah. Like very like tight biker, biker cops. leather cops. Right. Yes. Right, right, right. Uh, gets a bucket of uh, uh, billboard paste dumped on her head 
and Correct. gets shipped off to jail. And the movie is, can Mrs. Hogg get fine, babe, and get him back and, and somehow get out of this God for but Hoggett thing. is out of the action for oh, yeah. like a full 45 minutes after that. Yes. Right. Like she does. Yes. She is not really seen. And that's when Babe has his run in with the mean dogs. Uh-huh. And that's right. that's when the bridge sequence happens. The, right. This that's is when the, humans the just dog disappear yes. yeah. from no the more humans for an extended period of time. Because right. Right, he gets chased. I mean, he's sort of those those street scenes of him just wandering around the city displays, not knowing what to do uh, with. Uh, a family, I mean, what? We have four, three chimpanzees and orangutan, a and husband, a, a and wife. And a little monkey. Well, the monkeys right. come later. The little monkeys come later. They apparently. Well, no, there's the brother-in-law, the little brother yes, okay. of Bob. Uh-huh. Right. And and the two adult chimpanzees uh, both have hair. Hmm. Yes. Cool hair. The Glen Heady chimpanzee has like long lady hair. And uh, Bob the chimpanzee has like a fucking Steve Van Zant Sopranos like pompadour. <laughs> yes, this is accurate. <laughs> and, and, and then Thelonious Monk wears like a, a very tight three piece suit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like velvet and it has like a yeah. freaking pocket watch or whatever. Like it is, he is putting I on mean, the tight in terms of like it's fucking styling. Like yeah, he's exactly. on the that his part of the act is he just takes the signs on and off. Well, see, this is where maybe this isn't a different edit, but I got the impression that he was kind of the brains of the thing and Fugly was like kind of out of it a little bit at this point. So maybe when they were younger, they had this act together. But now mostly Thelonious keeps it going as Fugly is kind of like maybe losing a little bit of his edge and he's not so much not able to talk or say words. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's the conceit is that in in this the winter of their showbiz career, uh, Fugly Flume has now become the trained animal and Thelonious yeah. Monkey is kind of the human host of the proceedings, the MC. Uh, but they're wandering through this strange city. Babe comes across two very ferocious dogs who chase him. An extended mm. chase. Uh, Great chain work. Gra- <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, this dog yeah, is ben, literally I mean, off the chain. chain heavy. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, this chain sequence, there's like, there's a shot at one point with the lawnmower where the lawnmower drags into the camera. Yeah, that some was great bad. stuff. Great. Do you chain. think that some of the dog violence that was cut was the other dog dying? Because <laughs> it just so. disappears, right? I, but yeah, as, that Doberman. As far as I could find, that is what was cut. Yeah. Okay. But this extended chase where you're like, right, this is right, this is the Mad Max guy. He's doing an extended, hyper violent, terrifying dog v pig foot chase through. An unforgiving city until they end up on the bridge back in the Venetian section of the city. Uh, the dog jumps over or falls over the bridge, is hanging himself near death after the, the wide his, moment. Yeah, His head is suspended underwater yes. and his body for, is jerking around as he slowly drowns. He's underwater for a long time. Yes. <laughs> yes. It takes that pig a while to swim. Babe makes this active choice to to follow kindness and to save the life of someone who was just trying to kill him. Now, to a point that you made earlier, Griffin, I would like to just real quick let everyone close their eyes and picture. In the first movie, you see a pig talking to some dogs or whatever, yeah. and we, the human beings, see it. And we're like, all right. Now imagine this scene where we see a dog hanging from a chain over the side of a bridge. <laughs> to the left, we see two, three chimpanzees uh, while a orangutan looks on, there's an army of dogs watching, and I think uh, some cats and three singing mice as a pig pushes a boat under <laughs> to save the dog, and a capuchin monkey comes in on length, and a human is watching from the distance like, this seems normal. <laughs> okay, yeah, nothing weird here. I mean, it, there there is this, uh, I think it was MGM maybe, in like the 20s, had a series of live action short films called the Dogville Shorts that I am obsessed with. Uh, they were eventually discontinued because there were questions over how humane they were. But they are just sort of like uh, genre exercises of like types of old fashioned studio Hollywood films uh, acted out entirely by dogs. They build little oh, like dogs. Oh, like how TBS used to do the monkey movies. Yes. 
So they're little dogs on their hind legs wearing human clothes, and they're like dog waiters serving fancy dogs having dinner at like a dog <laughs> dance hall. I will send you folks links to them, and I'll post them on the Reddit. But there's this really weird, unnatural thing to them where you're just like, they're they're so well executed. It is so unnerving, the sort of nuance of performance they get out of the dogs. I don't want to know what they had to do to get those performances out of the dogs. But the sort of yeah. just like very subtle head shifts uh, and then the, the dubbing of the actors over it. Uh, it. It's this very bizarre thing to watch animals do human things and have the film you're watching say like, and this is normal. You just have to accept <laughs> all of this is normal. And the scene that you just described, Travis, is like, the chimpanzees are the audience surrogates at that moment. Like you are seeing this horrible scene through the eyes of the chimpanzees who are the normal characters, a family of primates wearing human clothes with little wigs having just abandoned yeah. their career in show business. Your point, Griffin, makes me think about what if you were just a crew guy, like just a grip working on this, like recounting your day. What like, the fuck was this movie? Like, what happened production? to you today? These fucking monkeys are dressed up, and I don't know. And this dog drowned. And this pig was watching. It's like complete also, insanity. Animal training for films, such as it is, uh, takes so long to get anything that you just have to imagine that, like every. Two minutes of this film took two days. Yeah. I was about to say, this must have been a nightmare to make, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, for yes. sure. Just the yeah. poop Good. alone. Imagine right. where they're all lined up down the stairs. That was someone going step by step saying, stay, 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 <laughs> right. yeah. stay, stay. And hoping that these like 40 animals fucking stayed in one place for the shot. That they all line up and you're dealing with slightly more docile animals in the first bay. But this one, they're just like, let's up the amount of dogs. <laughs> right. And we're dogs, putting and, dogs monkeys? and cats and monkeys in the same yeah. yep. room. That's that's nature's three greatest enemies. Dogs, yes. cats, monkeys. Mm -hmm. That's the class. That's why we see Tom and Jerry and Steve. Yes. And it's alien versus and a predator fish. versus tur and a fish. fish and one fish. Okay. Uh, David. Yeah. Uh, David. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, we uh, are adapting to these strange times. We are doing these episodes yes. remotely over Zoom. Doing a lot of Zoom yes. calls these days. A lot of Zooming. But you know. Who's Zooming who? Well, I mean, uh, 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 of course, the immortal question. But it's made me realize, oh, what I really need in my life is some more Noom calls. You know what I'm saying there? Well, if you, yeah, a call for the use of Noom. A call for the use of Noom. I want our elected officials to call for the use of Noom in this time. I got to say, this time is actually, it really is ideal for something like Kinda Noom. Uh, our friends, you know, who are trying to help people uh, bring some structure to their accountability. lives. Accountability. You know, set some habits, some accountability. Maybe watch what they're eating. Maybe watch when they're exercising. Things like all that. all of this sounds very topical. It's very hard to impose a routine on life. Absolutely, right now, you know? the days all blend very together. Very formless. Um, and so Noom, you know, it's an app. It's uh, sort of a, a way to adjust your lifestyle. Um, they can teach you the psychology behind the decisions you make. They can help you keep track of everything: workouts, steps, your diet, healthy recipes. And they can connect you with a personally assigned goal specialist and a community of other Noomers hey, I, to give you some support. I'm just going to re-underline this because Noom's been a sponsor on this show for a while. You've probably heard many, many Noom ads at this point, okay? But let me just yeah, let sure. me just bring your attention to some of these things again in the new light of our current global crisis, okay? This is an app yeah. that not only helps you sleep on a better schedule, helps you exercise, Helps you eat better. Helps you organize your yep. life. Maintain better routines. Increase productivity. These sound like all the things that everyone is struggling with right now. It It's true. I mean, it, it's really ideal. It's an ideal like, app. Yeah, Suddenly wanna, it's like... If you want to use this time to like maybe try and feel more confident, you know, have more energy, take better care of yourself, like 
Why not take advantage? Noom is like Mr. Miyagi teaching you wax on, wax off. And maybe previously you were like, what's the point of this? Do I really need this? And now you're like, oh boy, this is the most valuable thing in the world. You know? I can use all these new yeah. tools. Now I need them. I need them, David. So Noom, you know, it's a habit-changing solution. It's going to help you learn to develop a new relationship with food through personalized courses. Noom is not a diet. It's a healthy and easy to stick to way of life. Okay. No food's good. No food's bad. No food is off limits. It just teaches moderation. And you can use it in conjunction with all kinds of pre existing things, diets, you know, whatever you it's want. It's just, you know, casually teaching you how to look inside your own mind and make better decisions for yourself, a thing we could all use right now. Mm -hmm. You don't have to change it all in one day. This isn't an overnight thing. Small steps, David. Make big progress, uh -huh. much like a little gnome can go a long way. So sign up for That's your true. trial today at Noom. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash check. What do you got to lose other than a couple pounds? <laughs> Visit Noom dot com slash check to start your trial today. That's Noom dot com. N-O-O-M dot com slash check. So... After the whole dog sequence and then the Godfather-esque tribute-paying sequence sorry, Dave, involving uh, Jenny David, Bean, Jelly Beans. You mean uh, dog drowning scene? Yes, right. Sorry, Thank sorry. Dog much. drowning, yeah. Mm -hmm. What did he um, say? Did he say God drowning? He, he just said dog scene. I'd like to just, you know, oh, okay. clarify. Yeah, no, no. In in this in the third Babe movie, the plan was that Babe would try to drown God, but it never <laughs> didn't get to that, unfortunately. <laughs> this um, is another amazing dialogue exchange that comes out of this point of the movie when uh, he saves the pit bull, and the pit bull thanks him effusively. Uh, Babe says, "You're very kind," but and the pit bull goes, "No, no, I'm anything but kind. In fact, I have a professional obligation to be malicious." I and love, Babe says, I love this. Great line. Babe says, then you should change jobs. It's, Isn't it? The, he's so, one, it's just the dog say a murderous shadow is over him or whatever. Like there's all these lines that are so florid and kind of fancy sounding, which is Miller's specialty. That's the yeah. thing is that that dialogue, the, that moment between the dog and Babe is easily my favorite moment of this entire movie. Oh, where I was like, oh, I would watch these two on a buddy comedy forever. Yeah, they're pretty cool. And then you get introduced to all the other stray dogs who have somehow just sort of found Babe, including the pink poodle. Right. And who's and kind he of fighting. Savior. Yes. Yes. Right, right. They because the, the this babe needs to get a little tough. He needs to get his chain uh neck, the uh, what do you call it? Collar. His spike collar, yeah. His spiky collar, right. Like well, he, he needs to get, get a bit of an attitude if he's gonna survive in the city. So then all of the Animal SWAT shows up and starts taking people away because right. the neighbor is called. Animal SWAT shows up. And the implication and is, on. right, that the opera-loving neighbors are the ones who called the, call. the SWAT team on. And, they, and, it, and then thus begins like a five-minute long horrifying scene where we just Ugh. see one by one animals with like chokers put around their neck and nets thrown over. And like they attempt to kill the fish. Once again, that fish out of water for a really long time. And then Babe spits the fish into the canal. <laughs> and in a scene that for half a second, I was like, is he eating that fish? And then he spits the fish out. But it is horrible. The, the chimpanzee lady has just given birth to twins. I was going to say, out of nowhere, we don't know if she's pregnant. Yes. They have their great jelly bean, kiss the ring. Let's uh, Here's our ceremony to induct Babe into the mafia uh, scene. And then she starts complaining about her belly. He puts his ear up to it. And the next thing you know, we're in the middle of bada -bing, animals. Bada -boom, two babies. <laughs> It's a delivery sequence. <laughs> All the animals come together and help deliver these chimpanzee twins who are the cutest robot chimpanzees I've yeah. ever seen with umbilical cords. The way this movie had been shaping up, I thought the babe would be the one to deliver the babies. But he'd be oh, like, don't worry, I've seen this on the farm. <laughs> like he would he do has it. a little like scrubs on. Yeah. That'd be really cute. So then the like no no joke, five seconds after these babies are delivered, the animal spot yeah. shows up. So oh, we yeah. see her holding the babies, like get a net thrown them, which was horrifying to me. Terrible. And, Every, and everything of, you're describing is just demented. Like it, it, all yeah. of this just sounds fake. It just so sounds like somehow, you're making it up. Capuchin monkey 
Babe and Ferdinand are able to escape the clutches of these people. They choose not to take Fleelick, I guess, because he is in a doggy wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So instead, Fleelick bites onto a lab coat and gets dragged behind the truck for miles. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Ferdinand, Babe, and the Capuchin Monkey uh, go following them. They find Fleelick, let's be honest, dead. He is in the afterlife. He is (laughs) dead. You see that? Babe babe brings him back. Um, From heaven! Yes, which... Anyone who's watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I was reminded of that. They brought Flea Lake back, and I wanted Flea Lake to back. You should have left me there. Why didn't you leave me there? Anyways, <laughs> so then they roll up to this hospital, and also Esme is now escaped from prison, or not escaped from prison, been set free from jail because the uh, pig judge said, <laughs> I feel bad for you because I love pigs, and set her free. She is still caked in uh, paste and there's a scene where she's looking for the pig and I guess her now hardened dress splits wide open and we see her bloomers which is I assume why IMDB told me that the sex and nudity in this movie was mild um, <laughs> Well, there are so, also a bunch of naked animals. For yeah, these I mean, animals I guess. are not wearing clothes in some circumstances. So all you the see animals, Babe's butthole shot one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Babe and the Capucha Monkey and Fleelick and uh, and Ferdinand find all the animals. I guess where they've been taken to be experimented upon. Yeah, you're uh, also you're you're skipping over the fact that for a solid ten minutes of the film, even though he eludes capture, Babe continues running around trailing with him the uh the full whatever that thing's called that weird like it's like a noose, noose it's, on a yeah. stick yes slip he's knot. carrying that long metal pole with the noose around his neck and he's wearing a slipknot t-shirt the whole time it's <laughs> yeah. so weird it's so weird but hey it makes sense he's got that uh collar he's got that spike collar so he's just like He's expanding his horizons. So hard. I, I'm not certain where it happens, but also as runs into the owner of the hotel and mm-hmm. they make a plan to go save the animals. And the only clothes she has that will fit her is the, uh, is the fugly flume clown costume, which she dons. Also Mickey Rooney is like four foot 10. There's no way that would fit her. I mean, uh, there's a lot of things that are no way in this movie, you know, but you seem okay with it, Griffin. If this yeah, this is the this, only logic problem okay. I have in the entire movie. That, so that the same right. clothes would not fit Mrs. Hoggett and Flugly Flu. So the two of them are going to rescue the animals. Meanwhile, uh, Babe has set all of the animals free from their cages, but Thelonious needs to get dressed before they can leave. And in this delay, it allows time for the attendant to come back and lock the door. Now, here's what I do love, because this is never explored, but I think they could have spent a little more time on this one point, that I think at this point, Thelonious sees himself, and listen, it's clear through, there's a lot of uh, showing of this and not telling, but I think they could have told a little bit, that I think at this point, Thelonious considers himself more human than animal. Yes. Um, which, Orangutans very, you know, they're 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 very close uh, relatives to the human. Yes, right? he carries you know, himself. Yeah. He's not willing to go out without his clothes on. Uh, oh, that I, scene is so tragic when they're trying to get them out of there, and he refuses to leave because he hasn't finished fully dressing, and he's yeah. like slowly like putting on his suspenders. That that is it is both. Uh, I agree, sad because of like, oh, what a poor character. But also, can you imagine trying to coach an orangutan to put on some sugars? No. Like, oh, come no, on, buddy. No you just way. gotta, you just gotta, oh, come on. Oh, just God, slowly, slow, struggle with it. Yes. So then they have to escape through some back channels. There's a thing with the kid from the earlier thing. A funny elevator joke. A funny elevator joke. Funny. Uh, we love elevator antics. It's, it's good humor because the door's open and the animals are in there, but no one's looking. So then the door's closed before anyone looks. Ah. Uh, and then somehow everyone's at a big gala. Yes. Wait, they got to come face to face with high society. The whole movie it, has been leading up to the ultimate showdown, like the Avengers facing Thanos. Yeah. The cast well, of I mean, Babe Pig in the city has to come up against the Blue Bloods. Well, I think Miller is like, I've built this city environment. On rock and roll. Right? Yeah. yeah, I built this city on rock and roll. Babe is here, and he now needs to understand who the real villain is, which is the rich, right? Like, like the he's rich. like, we have to eat know, the rich. 
You know who's yep. been pitting the poor animals against each other and creating all, you know, like, you know, having narcs at the airport and flop houses that, you know, generate all this kind of bad blood. It's the rich. And here they are in all of their evil glory. But also well, to that point, though, none of them seem all that bad. I mean, the, the, well, the right. chefs. Well, right. It's still going to be rated G. Right. The chefs seem worse than the rich people. Most yeah. of the rich people are just like, what's happening? Meanwhile, the for some reason, the kitchen staff is trying to kill kill all these animals like it defies all like animal rules or just like i've never seen an anything where someone's just like i'm going to take this animal now yes it's crazy but that's a, a, no that makes sense for the kitchen staff they're good business people they what? see a free pig and they just take in its mind now yeah okay okay sure um, that that one that's a logic rules. point that don't work for me so that's that's chef rules that's ensues what feels like a 45 minute scene mm -hmm. of, 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 I would say not movie confusing bedlam, but legitimately confusing bedlam where at any moment, I can't tell you where anyone is. It is beyond Thunderdome. I mean, it truly is. This is around the time when she gets elevated off yes. the chandelier with the suspenders and her bloomers inflate. I don't, because the tag like a tag that we've only seen in like the corner bottom frame of some shots gets pulled as if we're supposed to be like, Oh no, that was the red button, but they never addressed that. It was a red. So she bounces Love around it. the room. She bounces around the room trying to get that yep. pig. And you think that if you said, Hey, Oh, you'll get this pig out of here. Yes, please take it. Yeah. We, you, we you, don't you, like this pig. This pig disrupted our party. We don't want this pig to be here. Yes, please do remove this pig. I shouldn't talk about the way this movie ends because I will be so angry. Do one of you want to talk about the denouement? This movie, the, the, well, the deus ex machina of this movie. Tim, sure. Lynn Lady Souls the Hotel gives money to Esme. She saves the farm. <laughs> Hoggett shows up. He's feeling great. Says, that'll do, pig, that'll do. James Cromwell is handed a check for $1 million and he promptly cashes it. I don't know. The no whole ending. Well, you skipped a part, which is that the hotel becomes a nightclub to stick it Correct. to the opera loving people across the street. And the takeaway is opera stinks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's for losers. Never call the cops. Say that. <laughs> this is my theory as to what happens. George Miller turns in the script and he's like, bada bing, bada boom, nailed it. I fucking killed it. And they're like, hey, George, this just kind of ends with her getting the pig back. And he's like, yep. And they're like, hey, George, in the beginning of the thing, you set up that the farm's in trouble. And he goes, oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, give me that script back real quick. Uh, hold on. Uh, they, uh, they rent out the hotel and she wants all of the to, animals right. live on the farm. <laughs> yes. Except the wheelie dog continues to drag, get dr like bite trucks and be dragged. Yes. By yes. Him, which and, is a fun uh, the, the country life was too slow for him. <laughs> right, the pit the pit bull gets with the pink hair poodle, and they have pit bull puppies with pink hair wigs. But to talk about how sort of foreboding everything is in this film. Oh, here's the happy end montage where we explain what happened to all your favorite animal friends. Look, Flea Tick found uh, trucks. He's still zooming. Oh, look, the chimpanzees became naturalists. They're now naked, living in a tree. They love it. It suits them just fine. And the pit bull and the pink poodle eventually got together. It didn't last. Like they immediately. <laughs> right. Yeah. In the nice wrap up, they just go like she eventually left him for some fancier dog. He's now a single father. He is single father to five pit bulls with pink pompadours. And, and also, the, the Thelonious is busy, talented Mr. Ripley in Cromwell. <laughs> yes. Soon I will be the husband. He is going to murder Mr. Hoggett. That feels yeah. like it would have been the third film. Uh, I <laughs> right, do three, love baby is framed it, for murder. It ending with the same final line, especially right. when that final line is such a fucking slam dunk. Like yeah. if you talk about Babe, as you said, whether or not you've seen the movie Babe, people know that'll do pig. And I think they know that shot. And as great as James Cromwell is, that is such an unlikely Oscar nomination that it really is that line reading that gets him the nomination. I That's the so. thing that pushes it over the edge because he barely has any dialogue in that film. It's mostly right. a silent performance. So then to repeat the same final line 
delivered by the same character who is barely a presence in this movie, makes it weirdly like, like Farmer Hoggett is like the Charlie to Babe's Angels. And at yeah. the end of every mission, he's like, another mission successfully accomplished, Babe. <laughs> That'll do, Pig. That'll right. do. I, I would also point out, Babe doesn't do shit. So you think if he was like, that'll do, pig, then someone nearby would be like, what did he do? He didn't win He changes some minds. He saves a dog. He changes some minds. <laughs> Went to the city, <laughs> did shit in the city, came yeah. back from the city. So he did that. see any hey, of that. Producer pig. That's what I say. He made but shit he happen. Yeah. He didn't right. see any of that. What he saw He's was- He's a facilitator. The He's a big picture yeah. guy. But no one saw him walking around the city. From their it point of view- It was probably all over the news though. This was all over the news. <sighs> Babe saves dog. <laughs> <laughs> Folks line up to feed him jelly beans. Pig, when I astrally projected and saw you save that dog's life, I was very proud. That'll do, pig. That'll do. He's very proud. Yeah. No, he's proud. That's what's weird about it. Jokes aside, is that what he's saying that'll do pig about at the end is that finally the water pump worked. The central conflict of this movie <laughs> is <laughs> the faulty water pump that almost led to Mr. Hoggett's death. Now, four nightmarish days in the city later is finally working well enough to spew some brown water into a bathtub in the middle of a farmhouse. <laughs> To which he has way, to say, that'll do, pig. That <laughs> pump is a death trap. Yes, absolutely. It's got a thousand moving parts. All of them easily yeah. will take a finger No, off. it looks normal, just like this movie. <laughs> it's very heavy. Yes, it's, it looks like it could any part of it could basically chop your fingers off. It's like a steampunk pump. Yes. This movie's a little steampunky. Uh, let me read back. some other insane lines of dialogue in this movie. Uh, Bob the chimpanzee at one point says, it's all illusory. It's ill and it's for losers. Yeah, that's a good line. But like, doesn't that sound like Mad Max dialogue? Like, doesn't that yes. sound like something Nux would say or whatever? Yeah. Yes, right. Y you have to accept this movie on Mad Max terms, that it's like right. sound and movement and energy. And it's all just like representational of how awful life feels. Yes. Like the apocalypse, it feels like we're constantly on the brink of because George Miller is first and foremost an apocalyptic filmmaker. And in Babe, a franchise that is not apocalyptic, he's well, saying like, well, the city would feel like an apocalypse to a farm animal. Yes. Uh, here's another incredibly dire line. I mean, this one is less florid, but just like bleak. When Ferdinand finally arrives, because Ferdinand is like the one classic animal friend from the farm in the first movie who follows Babe, but it takes him a long time to get there. His wings aren't strong enough. Right. Uh, a fucking pelican has to capture him and uh, fly him over in his mouth. So he finally joins the crew late and he says to Babe, face it, you're just a little pig in the big city. What can you possibly do? What can anyone do? Why <laughs> even try? Wow. Before you have made me think of something else I wanted to point out that I really love is we are introduced to the to the from an animal perspective, the toughness mm -hmm. of the city when the capuchin monkey steals Hog Hoggett's uh, suitcase. Yeah. And when when uh, Babe goes to get it, this is when he encounters the monkeys. And this is where the monkeys are like, I don't know what to tell you, kid. The world's hard. And I want to go into that scene. And if it was like people, I'd be like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I know it's, you stole my, it's right there. Just get, <laughs> the world's not that hard. You created this problem and you could easily solve it. I don't know what to tell you, kid. Life will chew you up and spit you out. I mean, not really. That's my suitcase right there. There's no confusion here as to what. No, but it's that classic game of being like, that suitcase there. I mean, that's his now. I mean, he's loving no, it. No, I he's understand. Doing a great that. job. But that is not indicative of the city will chew you up and spit you out so much as, yeah, we're kind of shitheads in this yep. specific room right now. For sure. But every animal in this film, every city animal in this film is just broken. It's just, yeah. it's right. just dead inside. I mean, that the poodle true. says, here's another incredibly bleak line. The poodle <laughs> says, Please, please, I know you're different from the others. Those that have had their way with me make their empty promises, but they're all lies, lies, yes. and I'm afraid and terribly, terribly tired. Jesus, and when that's Babe a line says, straight out of your street card named Desire. Like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when Babe says, where's your human? She says, my humans belong to someone else now, someone younger and prettier. Like this is a city that has been so unkind to every citizen. Oh boy. 
It's a wild fucking movie, and you have to accept it on its own terms or not. I it don't. It's playing yes, its I, own I, game. I choose not. I choose not. You reject it. Yes. You reject it, much like the city tries to reject Babe. Mm. Don't you make me into the city, Griffin Newman. Don't I'm going to make you the city. Don't you make me the city. Bring, 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 bring. Oh, another another Zoom bomb. Let me just uh, open the virtual door here at Virtual Nice. Creek. Oh my God, David, look who it is. Stoically coming into focus. It's it's Farmer Hoggett. Ah, Farmer Hoggett himself. And he's owner of Hoggett's he's Farm. He's tipping his cap and stoically nodding to us. Uh, yes. Farmer Hoggett, what are you uh, what are you doing here today? Right. Well, he's a man of few words. He's just sort of looking at he us really and is. nodding and contemplating. Seems like there's something maybe that he wants to talk about, but he's a little nervous to talk about. I'm trying to think long and well, hard of what... There's a lot of common issues that men face, but they don't want to talk yeah, about Yeah, you know, 40% uh, uh, of men by age 40 struggle from not being able to get and maintain an erection. And I... And Farmer Hoggett, he's a little over 40. I think 40, so. I think. Otherwise, those are just some city miles on him. Uh, but no, he's a country man, and I hope he hasn't been turning to any weird solutions or doing nothing when he could have just turned to medicine and science. David, and when you just said that, he took off his cap and he sort of looked down at the floor, embarrassed-like. Okay. All right, well, that's fine. Look, dealing with ED issues, it, it's hard, but you don't want to go for expensive pills. You don't want to go for injections, like where no man would want an injection. And he's stoically nodding, hymns. yes. Right. Uh, forhims.com and you can discover a tiny pill worthy of a big celebration because they are going to connect you with real licensed doctors Farmer Hoggett and FDA approved pharmaceutical products that will treat ED. Wait a second David you said celebration he's now he's rising to his feet when I was a young man I had ED my dick didn't work uh, great. Uh, he's dancing a jig, and while he's doing that... And I got it, injections. Uh, no, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do multiple in-doctor office visits. You just answer questions about your medical history online and chat with your doctor for a confidential... What report. I would by do the doctor. if my dick worked again. <sighs> if you're approved by the doctor, the products are shipped directly to your door, okay? Okay. Try him today by starting out with a free He's online He's dancing business. up a storm, David. I wish the listeners he is, could hear it's this. Great. It's a beautiful dance. I just have to call to action because you got to go to forhims.com slash blank. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash blank. Forhims.com slash blank. F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash Wait a second, David. He's leaning in very, very close to his camera. It seems like he's zooming mm -hmm. us from a fax machine. But he is <laughs> leaning in very, very close to the camera, and it looks like there's a, a faint moistness in his eyes. He's staring us straight into our souls. It looks like he's about to say something very profound. That'll do, Ems. <laughs> That'll do. All right. <laughs> well, prescription products are subject to doctor approval and require on online consultation with a physician who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. See website for full details and safety information. It's going to cost you hundreds if you went in person to the doctor's office or pharmacy, but you can just go for hymns.com slash blank. That'll do. Well, I guess you could argue that this movie is kind of in the tradition of horror movies and that it's like the characters in the city. I mean, Leprechaun it's, in it's, the city. Yeah. Jason, Jason in takes the Manhattan. City. Pig right, in right, a right. nightmare landscape in the this city. This is right. true. Yes, it's true. It's like, we all know X. And I'm like, yeah, of course, I love that guy. And it's like, but what if you went to the city? Next, Babe in Space. <laughs> Babe in Space would be fun. Fuck, I'd watch the hell out of Babe in Space. That'd be I good. I got it. Here's what it is. Because it's like, you know, okay. we, sent a, we sent a dog up there. We sent a chimp up there. A pig. I'm just saying, maybe Babe accidentally gets sent up in space. During uh, it's the Russian American British space race. You know, I, I don't can know. hear the record scratch now. A pig? 
And it, it would end with Babe parachuting back to Earth and splash landing, and then he's retrieved by the U.S. military, and then Farmer Hoggett says, that'll do, pig, that'll do. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. Every movie would yeah. always have to end that way. Like, if Babe defeated Hitler, like, that would be the ending. Farmer Hoggett Farmer would say, Hoggett, do. This film establishes that Farmer Hoggett is essentially the M to Big's James, Babe's James Bond. <laughs> yes. Yes. And at the end of every film, he checks in and it's like another mission perfectly as, carried out by Agent Babe. As Babe makes love to another Bond girl. Yes, this is exactly yes. what happens in every Babe movie. <laughs> yeah, could Babe get a girlfriend? Have they ever thought of reviving Babe? Like, is the Babe franchise fully dormant? Is that the, is it like, you know, I, no, I no like cartoon also, spinoff or whatever? Yeah, I mean, I feel like they had big ambitions at this point in time, and they died quickly with this movie. Um, I also imagine, because it's usually how he operates, that George Miller retains a lot of the rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe Even though it's a universal it. film, I think he's holding on to it and won't let anyone uh, run with it outside well, of... Well, uh, let's play the box the office man. game if we're going to talk okay. about that, because this film cost $90 million and made 18 Ooh, domestic. Huge. Not great. It made... It made 69 worldwide, nice. so it couldn't even cover its own budget worldwide. Yep. Hey, nice. David, yes. that's the sex number. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely 69. right. That'll do Travis. Yeah, <laughs> that's the number for sex. No, 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 you're right. Um, and it came out, unlike Babe, which came out in like a sleepy August weekend, yeah. it came out on Thanksgiving. Right, like Babe was a classic end of summer dump becomes a sleeper hit and an Oscar phenomenon. This right. was like, it's a holiday blockbuster. Right, and it is the highest grossing move, new movie of that Thanksgiving weekend, but it's opening at number five wow. with eight million dollars. Yeah, a terrible. And uh, s- some other new movies that are opening below it: uh, Home Fries, oh, Very Bad Things, oh, a movie that the Jerry sp- gave me nightmares, having never seen it. I just knew in the trailer Fair. that they accidentally killed someone in Very Bad Things, and like yes. that to me, I was fifteen. In 1998. And that to me was my greatest fear at the time and it continued to be my greatest fear until present is accidentally killing someone. Which movie has a bleaker view of society? Babe Pig in the City or Very Bad Thing? Babe Pig in the City. Babe Pig in the City. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the Jerry Springer uh, vehicle Ringmaster. So this is like a Do bombs away that? weekend. Like yeah. the, all of these it movies is. are bombing. But like, and in my memory, that movie is like he's sort of playing himself, correct? But like, yeah, correct. not really. Yes. Okay. Um. So the it's a it's a kid movie friendly weekend. These are yeah. mostly the top five are mostly kid movies. Okay. Can you tell me what's number one, Griffin? A Bug's Life. That's right. Is number two the Rugrats movie? That is correct. Wow. See, this That's is like, insane. Yeah, I remember this. This was a huge, huge fall for family films. The Rugrats movie, an insane stat I will never stop mentioning. The Rugrats movie is the first non-Disney animated film to make $100 million. Oh, wow. It snuck over 100. That's Into, right. Until um, 1998, one, no film not made by Disney had surpassed 100. Animated film. Right. Um a Bug's Life is in its second weekend because it yep. opened limited uh, on one screen and it makes $33 million. And a Rugrats movie, number two, it was number one the week before and it has made $57 million. I have seen both of these films, but not in years. Two masterpieces. Uh, I will say it is weird that the Rugrats movie was uh, enjoyed by children at the time because I rewatched that film recently in self-quarantine. And that film is just about as nightmarish as this movie. You you rewatched the Rugrats movie? I did. Least, like in the last couple of weeks? Okay. We're, All right. We are recording this in the midst of the pandemic. I felt like I needed to unwind with the Rugrats movie. And that film, for those who don't remember, is about a bunch of... It's the opposite of Babe Pig in the City. It's babies trapped in the woods. Mm. They're lost. And there is a, uh, a, a, a train, a Russian circus train that gets derailed and all the monkeys escape and the monkeys are chasing them in the woods and the Jesus. babies are trying to fend have, for their own lives. 
I have no memory of any of that. The only thing I remember is that the Pickles family has another kid and they call him Dill, yeah. which I think is funny. Yeah. Don't you have a thing for his for the dad? Yes. David yeah, thinks hot. David thinks Stu Pickles is hot. You think Stu Pickles is hot? Stu Pickles isn't. It's not like I think that. I just know knowledge. I know no, true Stu things. Pickles' younger brother is way hotter than Stu. Oh, that's a weird take. Get you don't think so? Because the mom, Angelica's mom, is where it's at, right? We can all agree. Yes. That. I mean, she's a snack. She's an absolute snack. <laughs> yeah, right? Listen, I don't want to objectify anyone. I'm just saying that Angelica's no. mom is good looking. Agreed. Uh, yeah, the Rugrats movie sending is fucking an image insane. to you all right now. Uh, I don't trust this at all. <laughs> what no, could this yeah. possibly What is be? this going to be, David? <laughs> yeah. You shut up. Oh, God damn it. Come on. Wait a second. All right. All right, open image. I'll wait for your porn. Uh huh. Stu. Can, while we're waiting for this to load, can I guess the number three movie at the box office? Uh, yes, you definitely can. No hints, because I want to see how many of these I can get without any hints. Okay. Is number three Enemy of the State? Yes, Jesus Christ. Oh my God. You're so, so Babe weird. is number five. Abe is number five. Number four. No hints. No hints. Number four. We have Rugrats. We have A Bug's Life. We have Enemy of the State. It's Thanksgiving weekend. It's another holdover from November 1998. It's not opening because Babe is the biggest new release. It wouldn't be another animated film. Um, Fuck it! I need it. It's not one, an animated film. One. It's a a sort of a a comedy for teenagers with a major star. It's a comedy for teenagers with a major star. Is it a high school comedy? Hmm. Is this set at high school or is it college? It's a sports comedy. It's a sports comedy. A nineteen ninety eight teen. Sports comedy. No, it's it's a college. It's set in college. It's a college sports comedy in 1998. Well, it's not the college drama Varsity Blues, which also came yeah, in 98. Yeah. College is kind of a, a mislead there. Like, I wouldn't put too much stock in college. I wouldn't be thinking about the college if I was thinking about this movie. Sports is a little more helpful. And is it a main? Is it a major sport? Uh, yeah, it's a major sport, very much so. Is it a basketball movie? Incorrect. Is it a football movie? Yes. It's a football comedy from 1998, the same year as Varsity Blues, starring a major star for teens. Little yeah, but major star, major comedy star, major comedy comedy star. This it's is kind of his. I am a no fucking around huge star movie. Is it Waterboy? That's oh what. oh oh oh. Of course, yes. I mean, it is a college football movie. It's just that's no, not right. really what you would think about it. Yeah, I should have gotten that. And like the most dominant uh, hit of that November. Right. Even though what 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 is the plot of the water boy? Well, thank you for asking, David. So Bobby <laughs> Boudin is going to school and he wants to play football. I can't remember. <laughs> He's good at giving people water. Um, it's this, based this on is a sketch. daughter's. Yeah, it's based off a Kurt Vonnegut book, right? I, <laughs> uh, I rewatched this film also recently in self-quarantine. I've been going through the early uh, Sandler's. Uh, the plot of the fucking water boy is Bobby Boucher is a slow man who right. works as the water boy for a college that he does not attend. Yes. Yeah. And it's based he, off of a sketch from Canteen Boy, which was right. on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, it's that character in terms of voice and physicality transposed into an entirely different set of circumstances. And he has a he crazy lives religious in a swamp, mother. Right. right. With uh, Academy Award winner Kathy Bates. And, and he channels uh, his rage to become a good f tackler, essentially. The guys on the football team are making fun of him so much that he tackles one of them. 
And then the new coach, who is Henry Winkler, goes, uh-huh. wow, you should be playing football for us. Yep. But his mom hates football. So he has to pretend that he's not playing football. Yeah. And here's and the, the really payoff- funny thing. They keep calling it foosball. And it's really funny. It's for, for the devil. Yeah. It it's is. Pretty good. I, I think it's. Pretty good. It is very bizarre that that is the movie that made Adam Sandler break through. Because right. the that one was the one where it's that, like, this is it. Yes. It opens to $40 million. He's right. like, he's the star. Now he's the guy who could do anything he wants. The movie before that, which comes out this same year as The Wedding Singer, which is like, yeah. okay, finally, Adam Sandler has played a real human being. Yeah. Like, right. he's not he's as angry as Happy Gilmore. He's right. not as much of a child as Billy Madison. He's playing a legitimate romantic leading man. He's got good chemistry with Drew Barrymore. It's a decent hit. And then the water boy comes out and he's like, good hey, job football. And people <laughs> flock. Everyone loses their fucking minds. He right. gets elected president of the United right. States. America's like one of these per year indefinitely. Thank you. But only one right. of those has been turned in to a Broadway musical. Correct. It's the water boy. <laughs> It is Coming weird. This July. He really only does three movies where he plays like a big character with like a voice and a weird look. It's like Little Nicky, Waterboy, and Zohan. Yeah. Yep. And most yeah, of the time he's like, right. hey, I rolled out of bed, I'm in this movie. Hey, yeah, I guess I got like shorts on her. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, he usually just hey, hey, buddy, does yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm in a movie, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> Oh God, we gotta do some Sandler movie. We gotta do a Chris Columbus so we can do Pixels. Oh we shit! Pixels. If you guys do Pixels, I want to come back. I've never watched it, and I've just been waiting for the opportunity. David uh, it's loves a great Pixels. Movie. It's a good movie about America's infrastructure failing to come together in a time of desperate need. <laughs> all I know is that within it, Josh Gad has sex with Cubert. That's all. Josh Gad does. Fuck Cubert. That's um, all I know about the whole movie. And Cubert has babies. They sh- do they show it? The babies? Yeah, they show it. Oh, they, they show, show the whole sex too. Oh, yeah, it's NC seventeen. And and while it's happening, Josh Gad turns to the camera and says, "I'm the voice of Olaf." While yeah. it's happening, which is crazy. Um, and Brian Cox I plays the Secretary of Defense. It's a great movie. Mm, and uh, and uh, uh, Peter Dinklage plays Billy Mitchell from The King of Kong, right? Correct. I mean, That's he's right. like That's right. styled the exact same way, clearly doing an impression of that guy. Uh, David sent over a picture of Stu Pickles. So I'm looking at Stu Pickles in one window, and then I'm looking at our grid on Zoom, our four feeds in, in the other window. Uh, Stu Pickles looks like Travis and David combined. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because it's like purple hair plus right. bags under the eyes. Tired. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is the image that you chose to be like, look how fucking hot this dude is. Yes, look it tells you so much is. about David's taste. I think you find Stu Pickles hot because in the same way that when you saw Joe Bowen's artwork that he did for our podcast, you were like, oh, man, he made me look hot. And both right. faces are exactly the same. The Stu Pickles photo you posted is just eyebrows raised, mild frown, bags under eyes, half closed, looking kind of wistful. Broken, broken man. Broken this man. Is like broken man. And you look this at this. This looks like Stu and- after DD had left him and he had to care for Tommy and Dill on his own. And he's just sick of them asking, where's mommy? Just sadly stirring a pan on the stovetop. And you look at this yeah. and you go like, that guy's hot. Damn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I stand a tie tie boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> ben liked that. I see I him laughing. In my I little did zoom. like it. Um, so we're, we're at the end of the episode, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to do, okay. do a very brief merchandise spotlight. Love that. Do uh, you need a, just a moment to get it ready? Because I want to show someone very special. Oh, oh get, get this ready while I'm doing the other thing. Uh, okay, oh, so I, know who we're I just want to say good. shout out to my cat, Pig. Yeah. She That'll rules. do, Pig. That'll do, Pig. Pig you in the sleeping. city. A, a true pig in the city. We stand a true pig in the yeah, city. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is a phenomenon I find really fascinating, and it seemed to be something kind of exclusive to like second generation, uh, early 2000s uh, consoles. Do you know there is a Babe video game 
that was released for PlayStation 2. Okay. In, in 2006. Okay. I, I do. I only know it. I only know it because I saw it on uh, noted on Wikipedia yes. or something like that. And I looked it up out of interest. And it looks like this game was made for the Game Boy Color in 1995. Yes. Like, it does not look like a PlayStation 2 game. No. It's it, like an isometric, correct. you know, pixelated. Kids adventure. Right. Yes. It looks it looks like a Game Boy Color game that was developed probably when Pig in the City was going to be released and somehow got delayed an additional eight years and came out on a major next gen console. Yeah, it has kind of like Sim City graphics. Right. Like it's like a Sim City one, like to be clear. Yes. Correct. And uh, uh, it does seem to feature the characters of Babe Pig in the City. It it covers both. It covers both the farm and the city. Uh, 50 challenging puzzles within six levels. Uh, and apparently it is universally reviled. Yes. Oh, what? Really? See. I can't. <laughs> That's such a, uh, wow. I would have. I thought, OK. I'm watching some gameplay right now, and I just want to tell you guys that the um, dialogue in the mo- in the video game, like the, the text bubbles are in Comic Sans. Hooray. Oh, wow. Blue Comic Sans, a nice regular blue. Basically, this game looks like clip art. I just sent a photo, uh, uh, Travis and Ben, you can look at it. But yes, it looks like clip art. Uh, the photo I sent is from the level where they're trying to escape the lab. Oh, boy. And you can see Fleetick and uh, Babe in a grid uh, and uh, seemingly a counter for uh, how many keys you have to collect and how much time is left on the clock. It looks like one of the worst games ever produced. I don't yep. understand this thing like... The Babe video game coming out in 2006. There's the Blues Brothers 2064 game, which came out in like 2001. Like there was this weird wave of video games coming out many years after a movie flopped. Yeah, because uh, people might forget that Blues Brothers 2000 came out in 1998. <laughs> yes, correct. Well, yeah, because <laughs> we had to get ready stuff. for it. You know, like the, right. the you know, 2K. It's it's a future proofed movie, yeah. <laughs> right? And and you know what? Let's be honest. Timeless. They call, could have called it Blues Brothers Three Thousand. Yes. Well, w- th- come on, Travis. We have to leave some room for the next. Oh, you're right. Let's wrap this up. Yes, um, Travis. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It's a dream come true. I just really wanted to be the last McRoy brother on the show. Um, it means so much to me to be your last choice. Uh, thank you guys. It's so not much. true. Not true. Okay, well let, let's check the record. Did have you had Justin on? Correct. And you've had Griffin on? Correct. And so then me, I was the third and last one. Third. You were the and, third and, and, and last. Uh, yeah, save the best for last. Okay. But not the la- not the last choice. We were saving you for oh, the for exactly. the denouement. I will say I was very excited because I remember you saying like, what, what George Miller would you want to do? And I looked at the list and I was like, babe, pick in the city. I want to talk about you. You didn't hesitate. We gave you first crack. I will say also no spoilers, but I have an extensive text thread with your father, Clint McElroy. (gasps) Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So the set is not complete just because we've gotten all three brothers. The set is not complete. We will find a movie for, for Clint to do. It depends on what wins March madness, which will be known at this point. But he has put in his name for a couple potential movies. Yeah, Once yeah, we yeah. know what we're doing in the future, we will have something locked down. Get that boy in. He's great. Oh, yeah. yeah. But thank you for having me. It really is a joy. I love this podcast. That's uh, nice. You're the saying. kindest. You've been such a good friend to the show. Uh, oh, for, uh, we saved you as a guest for this long, but you have uh, been such a strong champion of the show. Uh, and, and we uh, really appreciate it. And also just a good friend. Thank you. I love you guys. You guys gave yeah, me. Yeah, love you too. Uh, you guys gave me. Uh, and now I'm able to talk about the worst bad movie I've ever seen. Not fun in any way. It's the movie Aloha, and you guys inflicted oh, wow. that on me. That there was no. That I I believe there is no redeeming factor to the film Aloha. That that it is not like that. that huh. People, I because I love bad movies. But it is yeah. one where I'm like, this is no fun to watch. There is no fun to be had in watching the movie. It's the only movie I've had to watch in 10 minute chunks because I could oh. not stand more than that. So check out Elizabeth Town. <laughs> oh, I don't know. 
<laughs> I feel like that was pretty early on into you uh, listening to the show and you were tweeting about it. And and we were very persistent in the fact that you had to stick with yeah. Aloha because you I, were like I, tweeting 10 minutes in. Should yes. I give up on this? I kept I kept calling my brother, Justin, who had gotten me into blank check. And I was like, I yeah. can't. And he was like, you have you have to do it. This is a big you gotta milestone. You got to get to the satellite. If yeah. you can watch all of Aloha, you are true blankie. And I was like, OK, I will do it. I know. God, it it's also one book. of those movies you need to see for yourself, because if yes. you gave up on it 10 minutes in, you would not believe that we were being honest with our descriptions yes. of the film. Absolutely. Because that's the thing is I've tried to describe the film Aloha to other people and they're like, well, that sounds fun. I'm like, no, no, you are wrong. There is no way that I can explain to you how bad it is, because when I describe how bad it is, you're like, that sounds funny, bad. No. That because Bradley Cooper has a reattached toe. <laughs> they they destroy a satellite with the history of media. Uh, yeah, Asian. No, we can't. We can't. It hurts so much. Um, we'll tune in next week for our second episode on Aloha. We're doing a, a fifth anniversary of our Aloha episode. <laughs> because we have to say Hello Aloha to goodbye. Aloha. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's time to say both. Uh, and Travis, people should listen to the whole McRoy family of podcasts. Yeah. You can find it at McElroy.family. That's where all of our stuff is. McElroy, M-C-E-L-R-O-Y dot family. Uh, and when, do you folks know when the uh, Adventure Zone animated series will be coming out? Or does the state of the world throw everything into it's question? Rug. It's almost like uh, everything's uncertain forever now. Well, I'm excited to see that whenever it happens, whenever society resumes. And... Thank you all for listening, and please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Thanks to Ange Fergudo uh, for producing this show and doing our social media. Thanks to Lane Montgomery oh. for our theme song, Pat Rounds and Joe Bowen for our artwork. Go to blankies.reddit.com for some real nerdy shit. Uh, tune in next week for, of course, the logical follow-up to Babe Pig in the City, Happy Feet. George Hell Miller yeah. refuses to give up on children's films and somehow inexplicably makes one that everyone loves at the time. <laughs> it makes a big hit that wins him a fucking Oscar. What weird a movie. weird goddamn career. Uh, and as always, that'll do, pig. 